So this chamber is pretty much the same as it would have been in 1928, except for the added electronics and technical components. One big difference is what we call the horseshoe, the desks of the members. Before the restoration, these desks all faced forward towards the council president. But when this chamber was restored, the decision was made that the desks of the council members face towards our bosses, not the council president, but the public. And the public sits here in these pews out in the chamber. All of our meetings are open to the public. Members of the public can come to this podium and speak to the council about issues that are on our agenda or whatever else they have in mind that they want to, to tell the council about. So because of the very public of the entire city of Los Angeles. From this angle, we can also see Chinatown. Of course, Chinatown has been where it is since the 1930s and still has some of the flavor of that era. And off in the distance, of course, you can see the great Dodger Stadium, home of our Los Angeles Dodgers and one of the great baseball stadiums anywhere in the country. Now from here facing east, we also see historic Little Tokyo which has been the center of the old Japanese community and culture that has been here in Los Angeles, finding its center there since at least the 1920s. The Los Angeles River makes its way around downtown, and you can see the many bridges that cross it. And from here, you can also see now the 6th Street Viaduct, which is one of the most important recent investments in the infrastructure of Los Angeles. As I told you earlier, in 1928, no building in Los Angeles was allowed to exceed 150 feet in height. So City Hall, when it was built, towered over every other building by a considerable amount. But as you can see, that's no longer the case. As seismic technology has improved, as engineering has improved, the skyscrapers that you see now have far exceeded the height of, of City Hall. From here, we can see the Los Angeles Times building that was built at around the same time period as uh, City Hall was built. Across the street, we see the headquarters of the Los Angeles Police Department. Beautiful building, and it also features the memorial for fallen police officers. At the very top of City Hall is a massive light called the Lindbergh Beacon. In 1928, the most famous person in the world was Charles Lindbergh, who had made the first solo flight across the Atlantic Ocean. The leaders of Los Angeles invited Lindbergh to come for the grand opening of City Hall. And Lindbergh responded, thanks, but I don't think I'll be joining you.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Ad Hoc Committee on City Governance Reform. Today is March 20th, 2023. I'm Paul Krikorian, Chair of the Committee. And uh, this is actually, I believe, our the Council's first uh, live committee meeting back in person here in City Hall. So uh, we're delighted to, all, to welcome you all for uh, this very important dialogue about two very critical issues that will be before us uh, on today's agenda. Uh, before I begin with uh, any comments, let's go ahead and call the roll, please. Councilmember Council Krikorian. Here. Councilmember Rahman. Here. Councilmember Blumenfeld. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Here. Councilmember Hutt. Present. Councilmember Hernandez. Present. Councilmember Park. Absent. Six members present and a quorum, Mr. Chair. Very good. Uh, thank you all very much. So today we'll be discussing two uh, distinct and very important items. Uh, first, we'll begin our evaluation uh, of the CLA's extensive and detailed report on uh, independent re on creating an independent redistricting commission and potentially uh, reducing the size of council districts uh, and then uh, we will take up the municipal lobbying ordinance revamp uh, as well so we'll start today with uh, the overview discussion of the CLA's report that's item one on the agenda um, but just so you know, members, it's my intention that we not take any action on that item today because we are planning to have a robust process of public input about the report uh, as well as, you know, other input that uh, third parties uh, and stakeholders may have as to how to create the Independent Redistricting uh, Commission. So. Um, we won't be taking any action on that item. We will take public comment after the CLA's presentation, and that will allow members of the public to react to what they've heard in the CLA's presentation on item one, and also to provide public comment on the municipal lobbying ordinance item two before we take that item up. Um, just in terms of the MLO, I wanted to, to note that after we had had an extensive discussion at the last hearing and discussed many potential uh, revisions and so on, I, uh, I offered then to mark up a redlined version, a, a draft of those changes. Um, that's been posted on the council file. Uh, so on Friday that was, uh, that was posted and it reflects the instructions that I read into the record at the last ad hoc committee meeting so that everybody on the committee members of the public would have an opportunity to see it as it fit into the actual ordinance. Um, so we'll be discussing that further after we take public comment. Uh, in terms of the uh, first item on our agenda, independent redistricting reform, uh, we had previously discussed having a very accelerated timeline uh, for a number of hearings about the many recommendations and proposals that are set forth in the CLA's uh, report um, and uh, in recent weeks I've had extensive discussions with uh, stakeholders and those who have been advocating for uh, independent redistricting in, in a variety of different ways um, and it was clear from that input that most of the folks who are uh, are working on this issue would prefer uh, a slower pace so that the public would have more of an opportunity to evaluate what we're doing, to think about it, to weigh in, to gather uh, comments and so forth. Uh, and there is a lot of work that's going on outside of the building on this issue. A coalition that's being led by Catalyst California has already uh, had successful, very large convenings of community groups across the city and that process is continuing uh, in order to educate community stakeholders about the process and also to gather input about, uh, about those, uh, the priorities of those stakeholders. In addition, it was very uh, publicly announced that there is a coalition of leading universities 
that are undertaking uh, third party uh, top to bottom policy analysis uh, on this, uh, funded by philanthropy, the Weingart Foundation notably, and they're doing that third party research on best practices on redistricting and potential council expansion or district size reduction. And they're planning, as I understand it, to finish that work uh, by early summer. So in order to get the benefit of that work and to be able to evaluate the suggestions that uh, those third party uh, stakeholders are making, I think it's prudent that we complete our work with the benefit of, of that input. So. What we're going to do, or what I'm going to propose, is that we hold uh, two meetings in April, two meetings in May, and two meetings in June, and we'll go through each chapter of the CLA's report in great detail in those meetings. Today's meeting is going to be an overview, the 30,000-foot level uh, overview, and then we're going to be drilling down on each section of that and going through the decision matrix and so forth um, at those uh, at least six meetings, two in April, two in May, and two in June. And um, it's also my goal to have at least one of those meetings uh, in the Valley, one in South Los Angeles, and one on the West Side, so that we ha give a greater opportunity for people to weigh in without having to come down to, to City Hall. So I, I very much want to thank uh, the members of the CLA's staff. I want to thank uh, John Wickham, I want to thank Steve Liu, Alex Whitehead, and of course Sharon So for um, preparing this incredibly thorough uh, report, exactly responsive to what we had asked for um, with pretty much every conceivable issue uh, raised uh, and at least um, aired for discussion in that report. So I want to uh, thank you for that. And I want to give it its due by allowing this committee to have um, a, th a really thorough opportunity to not only to consider but to debate each of the, the categories of issues that are contained in that report. Um, and I think that will produce a better uh, policy product than uh, simply uh, running through it uh, quickly. So um, that will also give the public many additional opportunities to opine on this before we make any, uh, any final decisions. We should be finished with this entire work product uh, by um, midsummer, uh, early fall. Uh, that will be plenty of time with you know, months of extra time left before the deadline's necessary to put something on the, on the 2024 ballot. So we have plenty of room for error but that's also maximizing our ability to, to gain the widest possible public input. So uh, with that introduction, I would like to invite uh, John Wickham to come on up to the front table. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And uh, with John. that, we'll go ahead and call item number one, please. Thank you. Item number one is a chief legislative analyst report relative to independent redistri redistricting charter reform and expansion of the city council. Mr. Wickham, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, John Wickham with the uh, chief legislative analyst. Uh, somehow I've prepared a, a, a PowerPoint type presentation that puts in a couple uh, bullet points all of the information that we crammed into our report and um, I'll just go through that and please uh, wave at me as um, I go through this when you want to stop and have ask questions or have any discussion of this. Um, I wanted to uh, just um, uh, recognize the assistance I had from the other staff in the CLA's office. We really all um, contributed to producing this uh, substantial report the initial motion uh, instructing us to report had a lot of material. It was a three-page motion, which is unusual, um, and included a great deal of detail on all of the subjects that were um, to be included in our report. And so we worked diligently to identify as much information as we could to uh, bring all of those details together. 
And so um, Alex and Steve were, were um, very critical in helping pull all that together. We also worked with several departments, including the Ethics Commission, and especially um, Hari Trivedi in the city attorney's office in um, gathering additional detail and background information. We also checked in with the city clerk and the CAO on this as well um, to get their perspective on things. Um, and then we also had um, help from Common Cause and some other outside groups um, to make sure that we were addressing the um, topic as fully as we could. Um, the, the work involved understanding, first off, what independent redistricting meant or means, how it's being used in the state of California, and um, that resulted in um, tracking down um, and sometimes it was a challenge to actually track down the ordinances or the resolutions or the other um, governing documents for independent district redistricting in these other cities and trying to understand how they're structured and pieced together. And um, some places it's a little complicated on the way they structure these things. And um, so again, just really um, thankful for all of that. It took us a little bit more time than we initially thought. It was a lot of information to pull together, and as we pulled it together, we realized we were bringing in issues from federal law, from the way the census works, from state law, from these other cities, and the, the city of Los Angeles culture, the city of Los Angeles geography, city of Los Angeles population, all of these wind up influencing some of the choices that are gonna have to be made um, down the line. And so um, we made sure that we conducted it, um, not only put, bringing all this information together, but a thorough review to make sure it was tied together in a, in a way that was understandable and that made sense. Um, a lot of these issues um, you'll see um, flow through the report where a decision in one place is, is going to have an impact um, later on in the way the program functions. And so we will do our best to try and highlight where, okay, if you make a choice here, we're gonna revisit that at a later date because it, there are consequences. So you'll see a certain amount of that. And I think I need to get my glasses on so I can read my notes a little bit better. Um, okay, so that was that. Um, I had made this comment at a previous meeting and I'll make it again. Uh, we were asked to look at best practices, and we always look for best practices, but at this point, independent redistricting is pretty new. Um, the state of California has done it twice, and all of these other jurisdictions have done it once. So it's a little hard to say something is a best practice because it's only been done once, right? In looking at the history of how independent redistricting has developed, we saw, um, and I'll get to it in a little bit, but, but what we saw is, is each city and each jurisdiction came to the idea, they added their own flavor to the concept, they identified new issues. And so if we, it, it turned out that starting with the state redistricting process really wasn't helpful because they were really select, focused on how do you pick a commission and then just get them to work. Whereas other jurisdictions, the counties and the cities that came after that started to see a much broader and distinctive way of viewing it, other details and other issues, particularly with regard to how cities are set up that required additional detail. Um, we had the California Fair Maps Act come along, I think it was in 2016, 2017, that added additional state legislative um, intent on what independent redistricting should look like. And so you really can't start with the state redistricting process. You, you really, what we're going to build here for the city of Los Angeles is gonna be more informed on the most recent work that's going on in this area. And as I said, most of that has been done for the first time in 2021. And as we all recall, 2021 was weird because of COVID. It was weird because the census was delayed for the first time in 100 years. And all of the deadlines that would be associated with all of this were compressed. So um, we have in our best practices suite or concept here, some really unusual circumstances. 
Um, and so as I've said, all of this kind of, all of these factors weave together, you know, federal law, census, et cetera, et cetera. And we're gonna wind up for a unique solution for the city of Los, Ange Los Angeles at the end of the day. Um, and so let me see. And so I covered that, all right. So let's see, just so here's a quick outline of, the, of some of the information I'll cover in the meeting today. We'll talk about the election calendar. We'll take a quick look at past redistricting, very quick. Um, talk, uh, just comment on the ele California elections code. Um, three main concepts that um, emerged as we were looking at all of these issues. That's the definition of independent governance organization, um, the simplicity or complexity in what you develop. Um, there's a quick review of the 2021 um, City Redistricting Commission recommendations, and then a review of the redistricting process. Um, there's pre-redistricting work, there's the work redistricting work program, and then things that happen after redistricting is done. And then um, we can do a rundown on the um, components of the, of the in independent redistricting commission uh, process. Um, so the first, uh, I'll just make a quick stop here on the election calendar. Mr. Blumenfield, you had asked about this at the last committee meeting. Um, any changes on redistricting um, require a change of the city charter. Redistricting is currently a part of the city charter, so if you um, want to set up an independent redistricting process, you need to go to the voters in order to do that. Um, the California Elections Code requires that in order to put a charter measure on the ballot, it has to go to a primary or a general election of the city. It cannot be a special election, for example. Um, there are deadlines for when you have to initiate work, and so the council will need to initiate the action to, um, to put something on the ballot measure um, by requesting the city attorney to prepare the necessary documents, and that can be a range of things, resolutions, ordinances, et cetera, um, no later than 125 days prior to the election date. Okay, so we have that 125 date issue there. So um, I imagine the intent is to go to the voters in 2024, and so there is a primary election in March of 2024, 125 days prior to that would be sometime in November of 2023. So if your intent is to go to the voters in March, the primary, you need to be done this year in November. If your intent is to go to the voters in November of 24, you have until June 2024. So you have about a year, a little bit more than a year, to put together a program that you want to uh, present to the voters. And I'll, I'll give you a note here. Um, of just how all of these things are woven together. Um, the state uh, legislature changed the election calendar for primary elections so that in a presidential year, the primary is held in March. In a non-presidential year, the primary is held in June. And so 2032, the next time you would do redistricting is a presidential year so the primary is in March. Redistricting will have to be done by November, December of 2031. However, in 2042, that's a non-presidential year. The primary will be in June. And so you know, the time you have an additional three or four months when the redistricting commission could be doing their work. When you get to the question of when does the redistricting commission have to finish their job, you have a choice here. You'll have a choice of, do you just want to give them a date and say, you need to be done by September 30th, that's it. No, it doesn't matter when the primaries or when our elections are going to be. You need to be done by a specific date. Or do you set the program up so there's flexibility? So it needs to be done three months prior to or, or five months, whatever the time flexibility issue that you might want to give to the commission. Um, you can see how these issues now start to weave in and build together so that you're building a, a bigger program and it's relational to what's happening in federal law, state law, et cetera, et cetera. Um, anything on the election calendar? For the council, to, uh, for us to be able to put on the ballot on these certain dates, 
What is the basis for what you need us to do? Do you need the final language approved by 125 days? Or is it that you, we, you need direction from the city to begin to move on this 125 days before that? Um, yeah, this, this will require the city attorney to really have a fully developed program that they can put into ordinances or charter language or ballot measure language. Since this is so substantial, I would imagine the city attorney would appreciate as much advance time as necessary as possible so that they could draft it, you can review it, and then you can send it forward to council with a detailed program um, that will tie it all together. Great, thank you. Put a point on that, though. Um, I think the specific answer to Councilmember Hernandez's question is: We, the council, must be finished with our work completely with ordinance language in place before that 125-day deadline. Yeah. So it's that's not when we send it a request to the city attorney. It's an ordinance finished uh, and and finalized by that date which means if you count backwards from that with the time that it takes to draft the ordinance for additional committee hearings and so on it it sounds like a lot of time it's not going to end up being a tremendous yeah. amount of time yeah thank you yeah. okay great um so just a quick uh, rundown on past redistricting uh, prior to 1999 Redistricting was conducted by the city council. The council members um, prepared the boundaries and adopted a final ordinance. It was, I don't know to what degree, this was before my time, this is to what degree there was any public input on that, but it was done by the council members and within the council. In 1999, the voters approved um, charter reform, and that was the first time that the redistricting process, some portion of it was transferred to um, public participation. The, from what I understand from participants in the commission, it was new, it was a brand new concept. Nobody had really done this before. We're trying to figure out some way to um, transfer some of the redistricting process into uh, the hands of the public. And so they developed this advisory redistricting process that we have in our charter now. It's an advisory process because the commission is appointed by the council members and the, the mayor, city attorney, and city uh, controller. The commission then goes, does its work. Um, and once they are finished and adopt a final map, that map comes to the council the council has the opportunity to revise it, amend it, and do whatever the council chooses to do with it. And so that was actually new, and that was, nobody had really ever done that and kind of knew what it meant. Um, and then very quickly after that, by 2008, um, the concept of an independent, entirely independent commission had moved on. So it, the whole concept of doing advisory didn't last too much out in the, in the, um, in the sphere of the, the um, public. Um, but our first re um, cycle for advisory redistricting was in 20, 2001. Uh, we did that same process again in 2011, and we've just, we just finished it um, in 2021. Um, and we've so we've done it three times in this advisory process. The next cycle for redistricting would be in 2031, which is when it would start, and it usually takes about um, a year, 14, 16 months. Um, the city charter provides for an inter-census redistricting if there's a reason and a request to do so, um, but we have not um, used that option. We have not exercised that option. And just for reference, again, so you can see how things are tied together, state law prohibits inter-census redistricting for general law cities and for charter cities unless the city charter has specific um, rules that allow for an inter-census redistricting. Our, ch our city charter allows for inter-census redistricting, so you can do that if you choose to. Um, when you look forward to whatever program you develop, that will be one of the questions is, do you want to allow that rule, those rules, in the city charter? So just keep that in mind. Um, 
Okay, the California Elections Code. Ha, the California Elections Code, ha, about half of it is really set on, is, is about redistricting. Um, there are sections that are about redistricting generally for every city, um, whether general law or charter. And then there's specifically the California Fair Maps Act that was um, adopted uh, a few years ago that describes the independent redistricting process for general law cities and a few other types of special districts, et cetera. And um, so there are some things in the um, California Elections Clo Code that the city of Los Angeles as a charter city must include. And these are things such as we must use the state adjusted PL, um, the, the PL94 data file. That's a census file that um, includes the population data. The state takes that PL94 data and adjusts it for prison population. And then we're obligated under the, Cal under the elections code to use that state adjusted data in redistricting, uh, no matter what. It also requires that um, it provides requirements related to the minimum number of public hearings that must be held during the draft of the final um, review of maps. It doesn't matter, um, general law, charter city, you must have these minimum numbers, uh, n this minimum number of meetings in a certain process. There are, however, some things that um, the California election so code says that you, we as a charter city can provide alternative language. So for example, we can provide different redistricting criteria if it's included in our charter. And there are a couple rules on how we go about doing that. But um, if we include um, two or three, at a minimum two or three um, criteria in the charter, then we do not have to comply with the state elections code on redistricting criteria. They're gonna be, the same, um, but we have that option to include more or, or a different set of a criteria. Um, and then I just mentioned the inter, inter um, census um, redistricting criteria. Sure. Yes, Councilmember Bloomfield. Just a quick follow up on when you're talking about the different kinds of criteria. Could you give examples of, of what would be a different criteria that we could? I'm just trying to get a concrete sense of what that means. Okay, let me see if I can track that down real quick. Um, uh, the, um, the criteria start, generally start with um, compliance with federal law, which we are going to include anyway, compliance with state law, which we're going to include anyway, um, and we must and, and we um, absolutely should, no question about that. And then you start getting into um, questions such as um, con contiguity, uh, that's an important one that we should include, or um, compactness. And there are some questions about whether compactness is an important criteria or not. Um, there could be, you could create criteria related to using whole census tracts or um, other types of geographic boundaries that you, you decide are higher priority. You could decide that certain governmental service districts have a higher priority over something else. Um, neighborhood councils you would identify as an important um, criteria for consideration in drawing the maps, for example. State law is never going to identify those for you. Those are specific and relative to the city of Los Angeles, and so it will be your opportunity to decide whether they am, are important to include in the charter and whether there should be priorities on any of these. Right, they just can't contradict any of the, the state or federal, and, and a lot of, some of those are in the Voting Rights Act, and and yes. the legal cases around that. So in terms of compactness even, that's spoken to directly in the litigation. Um, yeah, there's, yeah, that we will definitely want to talk about compactness um, because there are lots of actual thoughts about that, about what it means. Um, it, it shouldn't be, we shouldn't be driving decisions about um, representation, access to government, um, 
interaction with your um, with the other constituents in the district because a uh, formula says you know mathematical formula says this is not compact if that makes any sense right so th one of the ideas I think about redistricting is we're um, it's it's important that people have access to their government and it's important that people have access to the other residents of the district to communicate and decide on what the needs are of the district and if it's driven by a formula then that's you know that's going to be a little weird um, but these again are the issues that you're going to be grappling with and in, in deciding on whether to include them or not and then whether there's priorities attached to these or not Okay, uh, right, so um, that was the, the elections code, I just talked about elections code section 21600. Um, there's also elections code 23000, I guess you would say it, um, which is the California Fair Maps Act, and as I said, that relies um, to general law cities and then a couple other types of jurisdictions. S charter cities are not obligated to comply with that. However, it's useful to show the legislative intent of Sacramento on what they're looking for and seeing with compliance with this concept of independent redistricting commission and that provides you some kind of legislative support when you're building your program. Um, and so there's, there's something that's helpful in all of that. And um, it may be that there are things in there that are very helpful and useful to the city and it may be easier to point to that and say that is our guideline and our criteria rather than duplicating or replicating some of that information in the, um, the charter when you get to that point or in our ordinance when, you, when we get to that point. So um, it's important to um, keep that as a, as a reference and a potential resource for the work that you'll be doing. Um, Anything more on the elections code? No. This is all very exciting stuff, <laughs> I know. Um, okay, this, is, this actually is maybe very exciting. Um, <laughs> the definition of an independent commission. So the California elections code is pretty clear on what they're defining as an um, independent commission, and that is a body other than a legislative body that is empowered to adopt the district boundaries of a legislative body. So somebody else, this independent commission, will develop the, the boundaries for the districts and they will adopt them and those will be the boundaries. Um, the other point is that the, there will be an application process to select commissioners. So our current redistricting process um, has an appointment process where each of the elected officials in the city makes the appointments to the commission. That would, um, under an independent redistricting commission process, not be allowed. Um, and um, in talking to a variety of people, the bigger concept here is that elected officials are not engaged in influencing the redistricting process. They're not... Um, um, there's a separation in the influence to allow the commission to do its work and not um, have uh, the influence on, on some of the, on the decisions they make. Um, the, the idea is to require that there would be interested and qualified individuals who apply for the position of commissioner in the cities we looked at. The application processes include um, objective criteria, are you a resident of the city, or are you um, a registered voter, et cetera. But then there are also subjective criteria, asking people why they want to be a commissioner, or what their experience is in being impartial, or these kinds of concepts that are, um, will be obje um, more subjective in evaluating. And it would actually be helpful for the, um, the advocates or the academics to provide some insight on what they think that means and how we go about doing that and measuring that because that is um, part of the process that is identified here. Um, so it, very specifically, the, the commissioner selection process would not have elected officials involved and 
at the end of the day, when a final district map is adopted, that will be the map that would go into effect. There is no um, yay or nay on the map by the city council or the mayor. Um, what they adopt is what they adopt. And um, let me see what my note was here. So again, this state law, the California Fair Maps Act provides you an opportunity to um, understand what the legislative intent is in Sacramento and what independent redistricting means and guide the direction that you would be going in on that. And I understand that there's a question. Councilman Brown. Yeah, I just had a quick question on the selection of <coughs> independent commissioners when you have a application process. In reviewing some of the other places where this process has been put into place, um, have jurisdictions found it straightforward to be able to find qualified people to be able to do this work? I mean, redistricting is really important, but it, it is also complex. Understanding the maps is complex. Understanding the regulations that go into, um, you know, not violating the, the Voting Rights Act is complex and wondered whether this alternative process generated enough qualified applicants in other jurisdictions to, to kind of do this well. Yeah, um, that's a good question. I don't have an answer for you. We can certainly look into that, and I think it would be helpful to have comment from some of the organizations that have been effect, um, involved in that work. Um, we in a sense recognize that in the decision matrix because on the one hand you have a certain set of criteria that you would evaluate for to um, identify you know develop a pool of qualified candidates if you at the end of the day you get to a, a pool that's too small then you may have to evaluate your criteria in evaluating the applications and go back and either um, accept more people from the pool or go back out to the public and, and work harder to get people um, involved. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to work out in that part of the process. Okay, thank you. I'd appreciate your attention to that issue going forward. Yeah. Um, okay, definition. And then just, uh, just a quick rundown. These are the jurisdictions we looked at. The way they, from a governance structure, um, implement independent redistricting a state was through the state constitution. Um, several of the counties are included in the state election code, Los Angeles and San Diego. Um, several cities have amended their city charters. And then the California Fair Maps Act allows cities, uh, general law cities, to either implement through an ordinance or through a resolution. Um, the, the resolution process is for each 10-year cycle, so that's really an unusual thing. And so we just have a, a list here of the cities that we looked at that are uh, truly independent and the um, process that they used. Um, we have this funny chart in our report about what, about degrees of independence, and this was something that came out of the conversations that we had, that there, there are steps away, you know, you could, you know, clearly if the city council is involved in the decision process, then that's, that's not compliant with this identification, this definition of independent. Um, you could take a step back from that and say, okay, the council is not involved, but let's have the city elected officials involved. Well, okay, that is one step degree of independence, but you still have elected officials involved, so there may be an opportunity for influence. Okay, so let's step back from that one step. So you um, designate city commissioners. Well, commissioners are employed in, you know, appointed by the, the mayor and confirmed by the council, so there's a role for, a possible role for an influence in that. So. So you, you can see how you can take degrees of separation from um, elected officials in this process. At any given point where you have a party, an entity in, um, involved to s review applications or prepare applications or um, make decisions in your process on behalf of the city, the question is, who should that be? what degree of independence should they have, and then what authority will they have when they are making decisions. 
um, in some cases it'll be, you could say that they have a decision to approve or disapprove, or they could have the authority to amend, or whatever it is you, you decide at, at, at any given point um, to incorporate into the program um, as you develop it. But just to show you how this plays out as an example, in, in thank you, Sharon, um, the city of Martinez designated their deputy city clerk to process the applications for the commission. And it was like, why would they name the deputy city clerk? It turns out in city of Martinez, the city clerk is an elected official. And so they made the decision that elected officials will not be involved in the process at any step. And so they named the deputy city clerk and a um, you know, staff person to be involved in that process. So that's an example of, of how this degree of independence plays out. In some cases, it may not matter. It may not matter that um, you know, the city clerk is processing the invoices for the commission. That's not an area where you would have maybe any concern about influence over what's happening. Um, so that's degrees of governance organization. Um, so our city charter currently has most of the regulations related to redistricting. We have one or two provisions in the administrative code. Uh, your choices in when you're developing this program is where do you want to put the program? How much of this do you want in the city charter? How much of this do you want in, in the administrative code? How much of this do you want in commission bylaws? Or do you just want to point to state law, for example? And this is important because y there will be a need to change. Cha change happens. And you will need, you will learn things as you implement the program. You will want to see changes made at some point. Um, to change the ch city charter, you have to go to the voters. To change the administrative code, you adopt an ordinance by the council. If you point to state law, you go to the state legislature and get them to change state law. So there are degrees of, of, of ease or difficulty in seeking changes. And so wherever you put something, you have to keep in mind whether this is really firm, we need to stay strong on this, we don't want this to be easily changed, and so we are going to put this in the charter. Or this is an area where we think that there may be reason to change in the future, so let's put this in the administrative code. Um, one unusual thing that we identified was um, section 703 of the city charter related to the ethics commission allows the ethics commission to set rules and regulations that the city council can then approve or deny. And so it may be that you would want to deploy a tool like section 703 where the redistricting commission can identify amendments or changes or revisions that would then they would adopt and send forward to council and the council can say yes we like that we'll adopt it or no um, we are going to decline to approve that that would be another way to go about that um, and then the other example i thought that was useful is the california elections code has um, detailed criteria on what disqualifies somebody from being a commissioner in an independent commission. Uh, you may just want to point to the California Fair Maps Act criteria for disqualifying a commissioner as the rules. In that way, you don't need to create your own rules. Um, you will point to them. You could go to the state legislature um, to change those rules if it seemed uh, important or relevant. Um, Okay, any, and it's pretty straightforward. Um, simplicity to complexity. So again, this is this, is this idea. Uh, you could have all of this detail um, in your charter and in your admin code, but you also have the option to refer to other laws or ordinances without um, replicating a lot of language. And, 
it would simplify the way all of this is implemented because it would be already in that other law. So you would point to the municipal lobbying ordinance. You wouldn't have to duplicate or replicate the municipal lobbying ordinance here in your in this section. Or you could do so with amendments if you want to refine something to some degree. Um, some things you just may want to remain silent on. I mean, the Brown Act is state law. This is this independent redistricting commission will have to comply with the Brown Act. It will have to comply with certain components of the California Elections Code. Um, you, you know, it doesn't hurt anything to say that this commission will comply with the Brown Act and the California Elections Code. But you don't have to. You can remain silent if you want to. We would, we would probably suggest that you do include a reference in that. But this is what I'm talking about in terms of simplicity to complexity. You've already got a lot going on in everything going on here. So the, it may be appropriate and helpful to just point to other things, include by reference, or even remain silent so that you can keep the reader, the, the law, focused on what it needs to be focused on. Um, OK, so those were the kind of the big picture concepts. and. So you can see when we're going through and you're selecting criteria for the map, um, how this balance between what's happening in state law and federal law and what's happening in the your drafting of your ordinance and et cetera are gonna be um, detailed and complicated. <clears throat> um, just a quick reference here to the 2021 City Council Redistricting Commission. Their final report included nine recommendations uh, for a council to consider the first two um, establish an independent redistricting commission and create narrow criteria for the replacement of commissioners. Those require charter um, action. But the remaining seven factors are all available to the council to act on through an ordinance or, in, or council instructions. So if, if the voters at the end of the day do not approve a measure to create an independent redistricting commission, you would still be able to address a number of these items, such as the time period that the commission has um, to do its work, or ex parte com um, communications, uh, availability of funding, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we did address some of these recommendations in the, re uh, all of these recommendations actually in the rest of the report. So we can revisit those if appropriate. Um, Next part is the redistricting process. We'll just give a quick rundown of how redistricting happens or rolls out. Uh, the, the first part is preparation. And something that occurred to me we didn't include in the report, um, and I actually for, didn't even put it on this slide. Uh, redistricting is going to start in 2025. The, the U.S. Census Bureau has a number of re, of Pro technical programs related to building address lists, drawing census geographies, changing the boundaries of census tracts. There's a whole, the, the, the methodologies for counting, um, uh, what are they called? Um, like hospitals and, and these types of uh, group facilities. All of these technical programs begin about 20, in the year 2025, 2026. And if the city is not engaged in those programs, the county decides for us, or the state decides for us, or the Census Bureau decides for us. So it is always, and it has been since 1995, it's been the city's um, effort to evaluate, participate in all of those technical programs to make sure that we are ahead of the curve on these things. This relates to how well the Census Bureau conducts its count when the consensus date comes up, and then that rolls into all of our numbers. How, how, is, that, um, how is that work done in terms of the city? Who does it? How do we know what's happening? I'm sorry, how does that work? The work that you're describing, how is it carried out? Does Today. it require council action? Like, Just give us some insight on how that looks. Um, yeah, so this is a little history of my employment with the city. Um, when I started with the city, I was with the housing department and policy and planning unit. And I got called by my supervisor one day and said, you need to go to this census meeting that the city attorney has put together. And the city attorney's office had been involved in previous litigation concerning the census count and um, failure to 
um, failure of the Census Bureau to relate, um, part, um, deal with the undercount that had occurred in the census. And so city attorney's office gathered um, a, a dozen city departments, including ITA, planning department, oh, wow. um, housing department, CDD at the time, which is now EWDD, et cetera, and formed a working group that met on a regular basis to deal with these things. And in that first, that first time that we went through it, we, we actually did um, a, a test count of the homeless population to prove to the Census Bureau that you can ask the basic census questions of people who are living on the street. Because the Census Bureau didn't do that back then. Um, and so we, we redrew the census tract boundaries to ensure that we would be able to facilitate the use of federal funding, like CDBG funding, in areas that um, had highest areas of poverty, right? We made sure that the census um, address list was correct. The, when we did this, and so we continue that every year, the same group of people, uh, most of whom have retired now. I think I might be the last person who hasn't retired. So um, when we talk about the City Data Bureau, um, this is gonna come up again. Um, in, 20, in, in the lead up to the 2010 census, this, your city team identified over 600,000 addresses that were not included in the Census Bureau address list. Wow. And the Census Bureau evaluated those and actually accepted over 400,000 of them as being technically accurate. And we actually had one of the best counts in the nation as a result of that type of work. And that involved going through dozens of city databases and dozens of private databases to identify those addresses and to bring them in. Um, I mean, that's enough to help the, you know, the state of California save a congressional seat, for example. That's the level of significance of this work. And so you, you see how redistricting starts years before you even have a commission seated, right? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so under an in independent redistricting process, you will have a commission selection process. There will be an application. Somebody will have to prepare the applications <coughs> and then advertise and do outreach to get people excited and want to apply to be a commissioner. Then somebody will have to evaluate those applications and, and develop the pool. So this is a, a preparation thing. You, somebody will need to be in place to gather the resources for the commission, the, the set, you know, bring in the funding for it, that's the city council budget process, identify office space, computers, other, you know, copy machines, um, all of those kinds of resource issues that need to be put in place. And then you need to start the data collection process because it's not just, um, the PL94 data, you need all sorts of different geographic and sociodemographic data. You need to see where the, um, you know, the fire service districts are or where parks are or where planning um, districts are, where neighborhood council boundaries are. Somebody needs to pull, start pulling all that data together, um, geographic, sociodemographic, and, and get it ready into some pathway um, that people will be able to use. Um, I have a quick question for you. Yes. Uh, so all of that work that you're talking about that may start years in advance of an actual redistricting process, is that work that could be done by seated commissioners if the decision was made to keep the commission intact for the full 10-year cycle? I know I'm skipping ahead a little bit by raising it, but is that the kind of thing that could be done? That is one of the um, ideas for having a, a, a commission of 10 years. And if not, then it would be helpful to have somebody designated to do that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, and so under your current process, the, your CLA has been um, the point for that. So your CLA under this advisory commission process has done all of this preparation work and coordination work and then assisted the commission until they were in a position to hire their own staff. And then this, your CLA would step back and it would all be commission independent staff doing their work until the report came forward to council again. But um, 
somebody, a pro, it needs to be recognized that there's a lot of preparation work going into the actual work and it needs to be done at some point before the PL94 data comes out. And one of the questions that you will have in the term and timing question is, is it a 10 year term or is it a term limited to the time to finish a map? And then the timing, how soon do they start? So you, are you gonna give them a lot of lead time to do the work or are they going to just come in and they're gonna hit the ground running? But just to recognize there's a great deal of preparation going in ahead of that. Um, the work program itself is uh, very intensive on the part of the commissioners. There's an initial phase where they're putting together their organizational structure, they're selecting a chair and um, you know, a management structure within their commission, they're hiring their staff. They might want to do special studies. For example, the 2001 commission did a special study concerning the population undercount. Um, so they might want to do something like that. Then they need to do a great deal of public education and outreach. Um, and the California Elections Code has requirements for a number of public hearings in, in the front half. I believe, um, Ale I don't know if Alex remembers, but I believe this last round, the, the redistricting commission had one public hearing in every council district. And those public hearings are about generating public interest, about generating public testimony on communities of interest which is a significant and foundational component of the redistricting decisions that are made when the commission starts drafting its map. So it's important to um, recognize there's a lot of initial work that the commission will do in this um, public review process with these public hearings. And um, I'll just make a note here and we'll I'll probably have to remind myself, let alone anybody else, that there are concepts of public hearings, public workshops, and then business meetings of the commission itself. So when the commission is out taking public testimony, that's more of a public hearing where they're, they're gathering information from the public. There will be business meetings where they are, you know, approving contracts or making hires or um, and at, at some point starting to draw the maps. Those will be in more like a business meeting than a public hearing. Um, and so I just have to remind myself to be careful with the, the words that I use. So after, they, after the commission does all of that initial work and has all those public hearings, they then start the draft map phase. And that's where they should consider all of the testimony they've received. They should consider the draft maps that have been submitted to them. And they start identifying the principles on which they draft the map. And then they start putting boundaries down on the map. They should be, that's when they will be drawing. They can, and our commissions haven't really done this, but others have they don't have to draw one draft map. They can actually draw two or three and, and put forward two or three draft maps for public review and consideration if they want to, or they can just do one like our commissions already have. But um, so they have these, these meetings where they will draw the boundaries and then they take that draft map out and the public has an opportunity to comment on the draft map. So that's going to be a different type of public hearing where rather than generally asking about um, communities of interest in, in general concepts, people are then starting to comment on actual boundaries and lines on the map, which is where the rubber hits the road. Um, after that phase is done, they move into the final map phase where they consider the input they received on the draft maps. They prepare a final map and the, Cal um, the elections code requires that there be at least, I think at least one hearing of that final map before they take the vote for the uh, adoption of the final map. So redistricting flows, the work program flows in these um, three significant phases. I think most of the work is in that initial phase in terms of the, the public hearings, but then the intensity really kicks up when you start into the draft in the final map phase. Nobody's got any questions. 
And then at the end of the day, after everything's done, there's the post redistricting phase, and this is the part that nobody ever sees, um, where all the paperwork gets filed and put into boxes and transferred to the clerk, where someone has to track down invoices and bills and contracts to make sure that the bills are reliant on a contract, et cetera, et cetera. Because things move pretty quickly. Um, and some people aren't very good about their billing. And so somebody needs to be in place at the end of the day to do this final cleanup work. And um, it, a year out, the CLA's office has been still um, dealing with um, some of this business work that the commission left at the end of the day. So somebody does need to be in place for that. Um, Okay, so that's the big picture stuff. John, I, I just wanted to go back yeah. uh, to the draft map phase that you described for a minute because one of the things that jumps out at me is uh, in that phase, develop criteria for draft maps. Um, of course, the virtually all of the criteria that matter are those that are dictated by law already that shouldn't be within the discretion of the council or uh, or a commission to set their Voting Rights Act, there are other legal criteria that, that are set forth. Um, yeah. I, I'm not sure how to formulate this into a question, but we saw during the last process, the redistricting commission conducted a number of um, meetings outside of the public's view and set a number of criteria for redrawing maps that the public never had an opportunity to weigh in on that were the whims of the commissioners and that then drove the rest of the redistricting process and it was entirely out of public view yeah. um, and not based on the law they were based on political considerations how many districts should there be in the valley for example or you know things like that that no one in the public no one you know, had an opportunity to evaluate her way. So how do we, I mean, maybe I'm getting ahead of ourselves, maybe this is for a deeper discussion of, in a future meeting, but if, did you look at whether, what the appropriate role of the commission should be even in whether they should set criteria? And if so, what are those, what's, what's the outer limit of what those criteria should be? Yeah. Um. I, th I think that's going to be, on one hand, uh, so let's start with those kinds of meetings should be held in the public and you can in your ordinance or in your charter require that those meetings be held in public. So rather than, um, you know, private conversations that lead to a document that's dropped a day or two or a couple of days before a meeting and then everybody is expected to understand what those, what those principles or criteria are, expected to vote on them and then that drives everything. Um, you would probably want to have requirements that those kinds of conversations be um, in public and that you have training and workshops in such a manner that commissioners are actually working on an even information basis, not just the, you know, the public is already at, at you know, trying to catch up with all this. I mean, the com there are commissioners who are going to be coming in who may not be caught up as well. And so there's a degree of training and so that people are aware of what they're looking at when they get to this. And then, but I think what happens is the city of Los Angeles is so big that you need some, some way to start bringing the questions yeah. together. So ensuring that it's all done in public is probably the best remedy for that because we do have unique issues as Mr. Blumenfield was describing earlier, y unique things about Los Angeles that, you know, how do we want to keep as true as possible to neighborhood council lines? Do we want to avoid dividing neighborhood councils to the greatest degree? Th these are all questions that are specific to Los Angeles that are important questions for redistricting, but maybe not dictated by law. Yeah. Um, so as long as those are done in the public's view with the public having an opportunity to weigh in on the criteria setting, um, perhaps that, that's the best solution for it. Yeah, and um, I, we haven't even talked about the number of council districts and I didn't think we would wanna get too deep into that question here, but 
when we have 15 council members or council districts let me let me be careful there when we have 15 council districts the question of how many districts there will be in any significant geographic area like the san fernando valley in particular the population will dictate at some point that there probably has to be some population sharing with the area on the south side of the hill and now you're going to be making some decisions on how you accomplish that that's a broad question that needs to be grappled with and understood when you're counting population starting in san pedro and counting your way up census by track by census track when you get to the top do you go east into watts or do you go west into um, that part of South Los Angeles. Mr. Harris Dawson's neighborhood. Mr. Harris Dawson's neighborhood, <laughs> right, right. So those are, those, are the cri those are the big picture criteria that um, the commission should be grappling with, but again, they should be doing so in public and everybody should be aware of what is the, there should be a conversation about what is the consequence of this. Right, thank you. Mr. Harris Dawson, you had a question? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is a question if you don't know the answer to, it's fine. I just thought I would ask because you, ha you have some expertise. It seems to me that you know we, we have federal law around elections, we have state law, and we have the Voting Rights Act and California Voting Rights Act. Is there now or do folks and do experts anticipate that there will be software, artificial intelligence software that you can just put all of that in mm -hmm. and it'll give you back a map? And, and before you answer, I ask it because if, at least if I have that as a baseline, I know what this is what the, you know, putting all this data into an algorithm would tell me. Then when there are departures from that, I, kind, I have some understanding uh, because the, how do I say this? Um, a lot of the testimony that you get around redistricting, the reason that you're hearing in public out loud for a change is different than the actual reason for that change. And there's no sort of body to call balls and strikes on, on, on that. And it seems like that type of intelligence, if it doesn't exist, should exist. Or software should exist if it doesn't. The 465 square miles in the city of Los Angeles and as many roads and streets and boulevards and census tract boundaries as there are, just that alone would probably um, break artificial intelligence. <laughs> there are probably an infinite number of boundaries that would result in 15 districts. And when you lay on top of it various um, geographies that are in place, various cultures and communities and the communities of interest, some of which are not probably even um, measurable um, other than um, everybody agreeing that yes, that's the boundary for that. And let me, let me, yeah, I, so I think it would just be from that perspective, incredibly difficult for just an artificial intelligence solution. Maybe someday, um, but yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it just seems to me that uh, a lot of these things are, one, the reason you're hearing is not the actual reason. Mm -hmm. So someone may tell me, oh, I want this many districts in the valley, when in fact, they have another objective altogether that having this many districts in the valley meets. And I think we've all witnessed that. Um, and, and so it just, from the public's point of view, I, I, I totally agree with Mr. Kokorian that all the decisions about criteria should happen in public. But, but the individual cuts and, you know, so some communities get to stay together and then other communities like Koreatown don't. Yeah, and, and by so the way. So who, de who yeah. decide, like, and, What's that based on? Yeah. And often that the who decides or who, which communities get to stay together is connected to how much those communities are able to mobilize to give feedback into this process. And this is a broader problem with participation altogether. I mean, the AI question is a fascinating one, mm -hmm. but I think the underlying 
thing you're bringing up is something that we can address through this process, which is how do you think about participation and how it shapes our city in ways that actually privilege who we always say we are wanting to privilege, which is the most vulnerable. How do we privilege a just outcome? Most of the time, we've set up a process that is so hard to be involved with, and this is true for land use decision making, this is true for redistricting. We set up a process that is so hard to engage with that the people who engage with it are the most politicized and are potentially somehow supported or paid to participate, or are wealthy, uh, are retired, they're older, they have the, the means to participate, they're less diverse than the rest of the city. Um, and I feel like those are the voices that end up being centered in these conversations over and over again. There are, there are fairly straightforward ways to get around that though. One is by doing a survey. Like you can do a survey um, where you call people or you can door knock around a particular neighborhood or something like that. You can find ways to solicit input that goes around these considerations, but I think unless we are thinking about that substantively in this process, any redistricting process you set up will continue to be biased and pushed in exactly the same ways that the previous processes were set up um, if you're not explicitly focused on expanding participation in a really substantive way. So I just, I think this is a really, really important question and one that I, I do think we have to grapple with not just in this process, but overall in what we consider public participation here in the city of Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's worth, worth doing it right here in this, in this process as well. Yeah. And we, we try to address some of that um, by doing more of an emph emphasis on workshops and training in advance. It's not, you know, and I'll tell you, it's really nice that the state law says we have to make the data public, but what good is it if nobody knows how to use it, nobody knows how to do the mapping, sure. nobody knows how to, I mean, it's. I, I, yeah, I, I hear you. I just want to tell you though, just one, I'm a mom of two. Um, I work full time, obviously. <laughs> um, I would never <laughs> participate in a pro I have never participated in a process like this yeah. unless I was like deeply deeply motivated on an issue yeah. um, but I, you know the people like you know young the people with young families people who are going the future of the city in many ways younger people H how do we engage them substantively in these processes you know I don't think th I'm not going to come to a workshop <laughs> or I would never have, you know? So I don't know, I th we have yeah. to be a little bit, and this is not rocket science. Like there are ways to do this that are coming out of the plan, urban planning traditions, for example, that talk about surveying, that talk about getting around some of these hurdles. I don't wanna, you know, beat a dead horse here, but I do think that it's really, really important to be considering this. Yeah, and I, I would just add to that because every word of that is spot on. The solutions to it, are going to be really tricky because if the council is imp providing those solutions, then some might see, well, so the communities of interest who are going to get attention and are going to get the solutions are the ones that the council wants to get uh, that attention. And so, and yet if we don't do that, we run the very real risk of a lot of communities of interest being disenfranchised entirely just because they're not aware of the process or can't penetrate it. Yeah. So who does that work? Is it going to be the redistricting commission? Is it gonna be council? Is it gonna be predetermined as part of the charter? Those are complicated questions as well just to figure out how to solve and, that. And problem. how are they funded for that work too? Because I think some of this work is labor intensive and, and it has to do with going out to people rather than waiting for people to come to you. Yeah. Right. Which is then, why you see a disproportionate disproportionate input from some groups in the redistricting process because they're just better organized, better, you know, they have the organizational infrastructure to, to be engaged. And from what I understand, what it, again, this is how, how this process is structured from the very beginning and how much time there is in the front end. And too much time on the front end may not matter or, or depends on how you structure it. But from what I understand, people 
slowly get engaged in the redistricting process over time. And it's not until they start seeing um, draft maps where people start to recognize that something's going on, I better start to pay attention to that. So the question is, how do you, how do you move that interest level earlier into the process so that people are providing their input? Um, but one of the things that struck me as I was reading through the different models is, you know, there's nothing that tells the commission they actually have to pay that much attention to the testimony they receive. And so it seemed kind of important to make a clear statement. Look, you, you know, you have to at least consider the information that people are presenting to you. You can't require, I mean, you can't require that they, they satisfy everybody because every, there's a lot of different things that are contradictory in the testimony, but you at least have to show that you made some effort to consider what people told you. Um, and so it seems like something that needs to be up front that you know, we know what the communities are saying and, and what information they're giving it to us. Um, the commission has always had plenty of opportunity to deploy the tools that they need to to obtain the input to inform their work. But you know, again, it's this question of time. Are they starting earlier or later in order to get those tools in place? They've, they've tended to start later and have limited resources in doing that. So that would be something that you um, would, again, will be considering. And then the other point is that I forgot what I was gonna say, but Ms. Hutt has a question. I, I'm in. Can you? Not yet. Am I on now? Hello? There we go. What, what's, What's an ample size of, of outreach and connection and engagement, you know, uh, uh, in each district or in the whole city? Yeah. What, when do you feel like you've really done an ample amount of outreach when we're, we want input? Yeah, I don't know. I, could, I don't know how to measure that question. Again, four million people, 465 yeah. square miles, Right. you know? and so many diverse interests in the city you know how that is a really good question and oh i know what i was going to say <laughs> rather than rather than this is this question of whether you put it in the, whether you put it in the charter or the ordinance right if it's in an ordinance and you see that the commission didn't didn't do the right type of work to to do outreach to get as broad uh, a pop, you know sample of the population as they could if you put that requirement in the charter you're going to have a hard time changing it if you put in an ordinance you're going to be able to provide additional guidance down the line of you know it's not just public workshops it's um, other types of you know we we anticipate or expect that the commission would deploy different types of tools such as surveys or you know, whatever you think might be appropriate so you can give them a little bit more direction on those kinds of things or at least set expectations for them. But just back to, I just want to press you a little bit, back to, to Ms. Hutt's uh, ask about, you know, what's the floor for engagement. We should be clear, there are plenty of things where we have a floor. For instance, if you want to recall a council member, there's a floor. You can't say, oh, we did a meeting and whoever came, came. There's a set number of people that you have to get to engage or else you can't go forward. Okay. So we have the ability to set minimum standards yeah. for engagement. Sure, absolutely. Go ahead, John. Were you, were you, were you finished? I said recall out loud. <laughs> No, this is, I mean, this is really a, a huge area of consideration. But again, it's a question of, you know, people, people need to understand the question they're being asked, you know, because redistricting is a weird animal and it's different at the local level in the city, right? And so if people don't understand the questions that they're being asked, you may not actually get meaningful input. Um, but this is where we're having a commission and commission staff that understand these things and are able to start putting together tools 
and resources for the public to understand is going to be so critical. Okay, Mr. Blumenfield. And then just in terms of the criteria that this council can set, either now or future councils, uh, there's that tension because if we are setting too many criteria, then we are moving away from this independence. But at the same time, as representatives, we, we have an obligation to, to promote certain values. For example, that, that we want to have, you mentioned before, neighborhood council lines split as little as possible. Well, plenty of uh, commissioners may not share that, but we being, having worked in the city, we would have that belief. Or this uh, idea that some of my colleagues are raising about a minimum threshold of engagement. So it's not just the same voices calling in every single time, but that we have this uh, surveys that we insist go throughout geographically throughout the city because there's also voices are louder in different parts of the city. Um, so those are those are criteria that we need to be able to put in, I think, as a as a council, but not just this council putting forward <coughs> the districting effort, but future councils. And that's that's where you said is some of this stuff needs to be done by ordinance. But if we make this if we push if we push that value of independence so far that it's outside of this council, we're going to have difficulty adding in some of those criteria because it will be any criteria we put in will be perceived as as gaming the process, especially if it's done too close to the time of redistricting. Yeah, yeah, and when we get to that conversation, the the, the some of the outside groups will have a lot to say about this as well. We, we broke it into two main categories, those that you absolutely must include, which are compliance with federal law and state law, et cetera. And then there's a whole range of other things that other jurisdictions have adopted as additional criteria. Some people would like those to be um, prioritized after the required ones. Um, some people think that maybe you ought not to prioritize those because the commission needs to act within the context of the time that they are drawing the boundary. Populations move, um, different criteria become more important or less important over, over time. And so the commission should be positioned in some way to evaluate what's happening in the city at that moment and identify which criteria are going to be most relevant. You know, the criteria for the drawing the map in 2001 after San Fernando Valley secession were different than they were 10 years later. Mm. Okay, um, we're gonna have to kind of get through the remainder of your presentation uh, in the next few we're minutes. It. I mean, that's really it. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, these are the, I, I'll just give you the quick summary of what we're doing in your future meetings. Please. These are the A through N are the are the subject matter. Um, we looked at the different um, models and use, um, use those as a way to kind of organize and structure. And so this is the structure that will be going forward in the future conversations. Um, and then um, we prepared text at the front end of the document that gives some context for this. And then we have the decision matrix at the back of the report for each of these. And it was just the matrix is a way to guide the conversation. You, you will have lots of different ideas and thoughts on how you want to structure that and add different things that may not be present in our matrix. But um, just wanted to provide a tool for you to um, guide the conversation. So. Can I ask two more questions? Yes, Councilman Bernard. Thank Nardis. you. Um, and please forgive me. I know that we went through some of this, but just wanted to confirm on my end. Um, what methods can be used to ensure the greatest diversity of applicants? Um, for example, have we thought about providing translation for that, the application in multiple languages um, or making it explicit that maybe libraries could be used as application areas? Um, we didn't consider that because I don't know that we would put um, that in the charter or in an ordinance. Mm -hmm. I think that there would be criteria at some point um, that you would want to set for that. I think you're, you hit on a point that is incredibly important that you know, we recognize would be part of the conversation of how do you actually get this idea out to the public that you can apply to be a commissioner and what the process is. How are you going to reach um, as many people as you possibly can 
and encourage them to participate in the process rather than, and we'll point to what happened the very first time there was a state redistricting commission. Um, the vast majority of the people selected through the initial process were attorneys from Northern California, right? You, you want a process that doesn't give you a pool of 60 attorneys from downtown Los Angeles. <laughs> right, you're, you're right. And so the question is how do we do that in a way that is fair and broad and balanced and, and not seen as, again, influence from yeah. the elected officials. Mm -hmm. Thank you, something for us to consider as we move forward, right? Thank Absolutely. you. And my next last question for now is, um, you know, talking about transparency and accessibility, I know that there's been some issues in getting some of the information out publicly around scheduled meetings. Uh, can we talk about, uh, you know, what we could do to p fully publish uh, the meeting schedules um, or and ensure that there's translation or interpretation uh, at these meetings and, and the report? Yeah. Um, for the commission uh, during the redistricting process, there is absolutely discussion on language. Um, I will tell you, we spent a great deal of time trying to sort that out because it's complicated and crazy and when we get to that conversation, we'll need the city clerk and the city attorney to help walk us through that. And structure how you want to put those requirements forward. Mm -hmm. um, because it's not just, I mean, it's, it's state, state and federal law say one thing, but you can do more than that. And so the question is, how much more do you want to do on that? Um, one requirement that we included, um, or one part of the, the decision matrix, was requiring that the commission actually consult with the Department on Disability to develop an accessibility plan yeah for the work that they do going forward. And when they do that, they shouldn't just be about physical access, but hearing access and sight and all of the ranges of, of accessibility that need to be included and incorporated. Because um, I think to your point, we need to make sure that everybody has equal access to the, pro the process. Thank you. And if I could just end with, uh, I appreciate that. Thank you for, for that answer. Is there there's any ways that we can begin to incorporate that some of that in our meetings? Um, that would be great, especially making our meetings, these meetings public and public noticed. Um, and if we need translation services for folks to let us know, because I know we have access to that. But that's what I would just also invite for this process as we're doing it now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Councilmember Park. So Mr. Ricks, I first of all just want to thank you and commend you for the incredible amount of work and thought that went into this report. Um, it was long, but well put together and well organized and the decision matrix was incredibly helpful. So thank you for that additional piece. Um, one of the questions that I have and one of the things that I'm going to be paying very close attention to as we move forward is cost and funding. And I realize that we have a lot of decisions to make about number of commissioners, whether they're going to be compensated and other things that impact cost. So my question for now, until we get to the, and we never even hit on expansion of council districts, and I, I will have that question when we get there too. But for now, for the cities that have done independent redistricting, have they, any of them, attached a proposed budget or cost estimate, anything more concrete than just the sort of allocation of sufficient funds to cover the process? Is there any way to pin down a universe of what we're looking at? Um, we, can, we can go back and see if we can track down any actual actions, either by the, it would have to be by the actual jurisdictions and see how they go up. But yeah, everything in the ordinances or in the charters were, quote, sufficient funding. Um, the one that was unusual with City of San Diego where they create this panel that goes through the selection process and also reviews and approves the budget for the commission. And so that was a, a unique um, solution on the cost side of it. So um, there are a few things there, but we could go back and see if we can track down the actual mechanisms for the funding. Okay, yeah, just something for us to think about and that's yeah. something that I'm gonna have a lot of questions about as we continue our discussion on this. Okay. Thanks again, great Excellent. report. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good stuff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other comments or questions at this point, members? 
I just want to say I'm glad someone's excited about this. <laughs> it's you, you know? This is very dense, and so really but appreciate the work you're doing and absolutely. your excitement that you bring to it because it helps us also get excited about it. Well, it, it, I, it's I, like so many things that we do. The end result is exciting. The process of getting there, maybe not so much all the time, <laughs> but it's important work. Well, I'm very grateful to not have this just in my head anymore. It's oh, all nice. in all of your heads as well. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Wickham. Appreciate it. Uh, we're going to hold this matter in, in committee members and uh, for much further consideration. So we're ready to go now to public comment. and. Oh, Councilman Brum. I need to read amendments before public comment. I have some. Oh. I have a proposed amendment. For oh, that. okay. Yeah. Can I do that? Now? Uh, sure. Okay. okay so, uh, um, I just wanted to, uh, before we moved on to public comment on item two, um, I wanted to present an amendment to the committee and wanted to make sure that the public heard the amendment beforehand and the amendment it basically the language here is I move that the matter of the ad hoc committee on city governance reform report relative to updates to the municipal lobbying ordinance consideration of revised proposed ordinance item two on today's ad hoc committee um, be amended as follows one specify that nonprofit representatives listed on the disclosure forms of nonprofit filers shall not be eligible to serve on the Ethics Commission, and two, require nonprofit filers to disclose the same information regarding gifts, contributions, and fundraising activity and solicitations as lobbyists and major filers for both the nonprofit filer itself and for nonprofit representatives. Okay. And, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we will go ahead then and begin uh, with our public comment of those who are here uh, in the council chambers. And as I call your name, if you could please uh, come over to your left, my right, so, uh, so that the sergeant can um, show you to the microphone. We'll start with, oh, and um, I wanted to mention today is a special meeting of this ad hoc committee, so we won't be taking general public comment. We'll only be taking comment on the two agenda items, independent redistricting and uh, the municipal lobbying ordinance. And I know that there are many uh, neighborhood councils that have prepared uh, community impact statements on this. Many of them were already presented in our last meeting. And so I would ask in the interests of time, if you've already done that, okay. please come up and, and comment. But I, I would like to reserve the additional time for CISs for those neighborhood councils who haven't yet had an opportunity uh, to read their CIS into the statement. All of your CISs will be received, but in terms of extending the time, I, I'm going to reserve that only for those neighborhood councils who haven't already had the extended time period. So, um, oh yes, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for that reminder. Um, before we begin our speakers here in the council chambers, I would like to ask uh, that the clerk and the city attorney uh, present the call-in instructions uh, for those who wish to participate by phone. Thank you. The, the committee will... Thank you. Uh, members of the public who would like to offer public comment to the committee via teleconference should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 160-151-5313. And then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star nine to request to speak. Thank you. Hi. Great, I'm mic'd. So the instructions are very simple. Um, you have one minute per item to speak, up to two minutes total. As the council president said, this is a special meeting, so there's no general public comment. You have to stick to the two items on the agenda. Please stay on topic. We really do want to get through as many people as we can on this important issue. So if you're not on topic or if you can't tell whether, we can't tell whether you're on topic, you're going to get one brief warning from me or the president. That point, if you don't get immediately clearly on topic, and forfeit, unfortunately, you'll forfeit your speaking time. Um, and that's really it. So, um, oh, and I should say, as always, there's a brief time delay involved um, between the live meeting and the broadcast, so 
turn down the volume on other devices when it's your turn to speak, like YouTube or Channel 35, and please keep one ear to the phone when you're waiting so you hear in real time when we call your name or the last four digits of your phone number. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. Great. Thank you very much. So I'm going to call out several names. As I call your name, just please come to the left uh, of the Council Chambers. Camille Lewis, Heath Klein. Um, it, it's entered as here, H-E-A-R. I don't know if that's um, just a misspelling of Heath or not. But um, And then uh, Lionel Mars, please. Good afternoon. Oops, let's see. I'm not live. I don't hear an echo. There we go. I'm Heath Klein, the second person asked to come up and speak. And uh, I'm here representing myself, and I'm also here representing the Woodland Hills Warner Center Neighborhood Council. And we have presented our CIS, and that has not changed, so I will not repeat it but I'll make reference to it in light of what's being discussed here today. And the first thing I'd like to say is we heard the very poignant question just a couple moments ago about how do we get more participation in the city? How do we get people to want to participate in the redistricting commission, whatever that turns out to be, and everything else? And it's really very simple. We need to restore trust in government. Trust in government is what drives stakeholder participation. I'll be honest with you. I was texting with some friends waiting to speak here. And they're all writing back to me. You're still doing that? You're still wasting your time? You think those people down there on Spring Street give a blank about what stakeholders think? I've lost so many friends because I haven't given up on you folks. And I hope that when we get to considering the MLO and so forth, we will consider that. And I would like to use my neighborhood council time to speak on the reforms for that. So I'd like the five minutes for that. But I don't think I'll require all of it. So. The Woodland Hills Warner Center Neighborhood Council, when uh, we passed... So, wait, b before you begin, sir, I, I'm sorry. I thought that you had said that you had already, the Neighborhood Council had already submitted a community impact statement. We have on both. We haven't spoken on the redistricting, and we have not... Um, okay. You said at the last meeting, because okay. of the changes that were introduced, we'd get time to speak again, so I want to speak to the changes. Okay, sure. Go right ahead. Thank you very much. And if I can reclaim my five minutes, please. So, our neighborhood council is firmly opposed to any exemptions for 501c3s or c5s. We see them abuse their privileges when they come before the neighborhood councils, when they come before this body and other boards and commissions within the city. They misrepresent themselves, they have their special interests, and it's not fair that you're going to exempt them. If you're lobbying because you have an interest in the city, whether it's a preferential building material or to get a city contract to build homeless or to do evaluations. You know, look at, you want to give USC an exemption? Please. You know, I just got done paying for my daughter to go there for four years. They don't need any exemptions. <laughs> They're well compensated. You want to give them more money. You see the back and forth with the city council and people on this council that have had dealings with the school. They don't need any exemptions. So we don't want to see that. And it's not right that the unions, you know, quite literally franchise their names to special interest groups to come before you or come before city councils. It's fine for Martha Stewart to license her name for painter housewares 
it's not okay when a nonprofit does it to carry the baggage of an organization that if they showed their true colors, they wouldn't get the same consideration. And when you ask, where are the nonprofits? Oh, they're, they're not here today. They're not at the next meeting. They're not at the next meeting either. But they did license their name and the people like to use it as cover. That shouldn't be allowed to continue. Uh, the LA Federation of Labor, to give them an exemption or the organizations they represent other than for collective bargaining? No. They have enough influence. We've seen the harm they've caused in this city and to this body today that has had a change of uh, membership because of what's come out from their dealings. No exemptions, please. You had it right in the first draft of the MLO reform and uh, President Kikorian, I think it's wrong for you to introduce these changes now. It's fine to exempt them as far as the nonprofits, as far as fees are concerned. They can have simplified reporting requirements, but no exemptions not to register. They're here to take money from the taxpayers or influence and get privileges within the city so they need to disclose themselves no matter where and how they're appearing. So again, I'll just conclude by saying lobbying is lobbying no matter who's doing it and anyone that's lobbying, whether it's me or anyone else that comes to appear before you, needs to disclose that to bodies and that's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lionel Mars, please. Uh, Luo and Michelle Gallagher, please. Good afternoon, council members, committee members. My name is Lionel Mars. I'm from Sun Valley Area Neighborhood Council. I'm here in my own capacity as an individual. I'd like to comment item two. Um, we strongly oppose any increase to the 501c3's exemptions approved by the Government Reform Committee. The committee's recommendation is narrowly tailored and provides a reasonable accommodations for generally genuinely small nonprofits. The Exec Commission proposal is an open invitation for special interest to create nonprofit fund groups where they can avoid regulation. It will allow hundreds of thousands of dollars in lobbying to go completely unreported. And we strongly oppose creating a new exemption for 501c5. The LA Fed is one of the uh, of, if not the most powerful interest in LA City Hall. It was at the heart of our most recent scandals. We cannot cave in to uh, their demands to be exempted from the MLO. The LA Fed secretly conspired to launder a secret map in front of the commission, rig our city council district and install a rep in District 10. Thank you. Thank you. Luo, Michelle Gallagher, and Mr. G, please. and Rob Kwan as well. All right, I'll speak to all the items. Go ahead. Um, yes. Go ahead, you have two minutes. Yeah, so first of all, I'd like to point out that this meeting is not being held legally because you're illegally keeping people out of this meeting. That's not government reform, so I'm just going to point that out. It's a black woman, nonetheless, who's telling you to actually stick with the agenda. Do government reform. We have reform. two items on the agenda. Stick with those items. Yeah, I know you don't want that public out there. Um, yeah, so this whole thing is you're basically trying to gut the um, lobbying reform because you you don't want to actually prevent what happened. Um, so you're just you know re, you're just exempting you know every people from it and that's like you should every we should know who's lobbying for the city that's just and especially for you know the kinds of groups they're going to be exempted from this 
you're, um, you know, that's, um, you, people should know who's lobbying for the city. Now for redistricting reform, I think all of you know that what happened was, was wrong. Ray, Anta, and, and the, and the Nuri, Martinez, Gil Cedillo, and Kevin DeLeon, who you continue to welcome on this council, by the way, um, was, um, as well as the former LA Fed chair, um, Ron Herrera, was, President Ron Herrera was in this meeting, and they were gerrymandering the sit, the dis redistricting in such a way that secretly, in an anti-black, anti-indigenous, anti-tenant way, um, so the redistricting needs to be taken all out of this council, um, and it needs to be done by, the council should not be influencing who's on the redistricting. Um, so yeah, let everyone in. This meeting's being held illegally um, because you're banning people legally. Thank you. Luo, Michelle Gallagher, Rob Kwan, and Charlie Mims, please. So I'm speaking on both items. Uh, my name is Michelle Gallagher, and I'm with your city neighbor council, but speaking um, only for myself. I'm going to start with redistricting. Um, so it was said that we shouldn't start the process of redistricting by looking at the state process, and how, uh, which was largely concerned with how they selected commissioners. But I'd like to remind everybody that uh, the largest mechanism used to do the awful, racist, blah, 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 scandal, ridden um, process was in fact the manipulation of who was the, the uh, commissioner and who was not at, at different times. And so I think definitely look at the state process, which was actually very, very interesting. Um, I'll also say that if we go with, um, and I, I did actually read the report in its entirety, um, if we go with the a, a uh, 2027, 2028, or 2029 start date for the uh, for the seating of the, of the commission, that will give us 10 years of having used the um, districts that we, have, that we have now that were a result of the racist, biased, completely scandal-ridden, probably totally illegitimate uh, process for which we are lucky not to have legal challenges that are serious. Moving on uh, to the MLO. So we, we need, if we want to have government participation, we need to have trust. Uh, that needs to be rebuilt. This is, this is the reason why this commission, um, we, well, sorry, why this ad hoc committee actually exists. But we've eliminated the clause um, 20, uh, 4802B3, which, uh, which said that all persons engaged in comp um, compensated activities um, are going to be treated equally if they're influencing the decisions of this, of this body. Uh, it's not enough just to say, look, the 501 C3s or, 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 or C5s can't be ethics commissioners. What is, is it, are we going to say that only on the ethics commission shall we have ethics? Get it together, guys. We need to rebuild the trust for anything to work. Thank you. Thank you. Luo, Rob Kwan, and Charlie Mims, please. I'd like to speak on both items and begin by apologizing to everybody in the public who had to wait through a two-hour presentation as our council members talked about how inaccessible uh, public participation is. I hope we find the guy behind that. Um, we need to avoid the temptation to rush through charter reform that would not only undermine good policy but the performance of the ballot measure. A, a midsummer vote does not give us time for CD6 to seat a council member so they can participate in this conversation. I would also say, what if Herb Wesson didn't rush through public banking? Maybe that would have actually been successful if we got it right. What if he didn't rush through Measure C? We wouldn't be doing a do-over six years later. Your best argument for the state to stand down and for the people to support charter reform, in spite of every reason they shouldn't trust you people, is that we had a thorough, transparent, and inclusive charter reform process, and that this measure is the product of the people and not backroom self-deals. I would also note that I have a feeling that somebody's trying to stack the deck here on expansion because the CLA report provides an objective analysis on redistricting, but we get to expansion and it excludes any real discussion of increasing our council beyond 25 members. The decision matrix lists 17, 19, and other as options. And the CLA, I don't blame them. They've got a boss of a boss that kind of dictates things around here. 
I'd also like to thank for the next item, Nuri Martinez for providing a textbook example for why this current proposal is absolutely reckless and unacceptable. What was Nuri Martinez ranting about before Kevin DeLeon interrupted her to talk about the four blacks on council? LAX and quote, billions of dollars worth of contracts at the airport. We're negotiating with labor on all this shit. You wanna be a baller? Go after that, because that's where the fucking money is at. The LA Fed owns this place, and if you advance the council president's amendments as is, you will merely be codifying that as a fact in our municipal code. Lastly, I'd say set some upper limits for these nonprofits. There's a difference between AIDS Healthcare Foundation and everybody else out there in USC. Thank you. Okay, Jennifer Goody, Charlie Mims, Chad Boggio, and Jamie York, please. Hi, I have a community impact statement for Mid-City Neighborhood Council. The Mid-City Neighborhood Council objects to the exemptions being considered in the MLO for 501c3s and 501c5s. It is colluding with these special interests that has brought unparalleled shame and corruption to the LA City Hall and made us an international punchline to jokes about political corruption and rot. For the so-called reformers to be promising transparency to the public out of one side of their mouths while bargaining with these organizations out the other is unconscionable. Council President Kokorian calls his work on governance reform the responsibility of a lifetime. But we have to question his commitment to actually bringing about meaningful change with these exemptions on the table. What will his legacy be? The man that cleaned up City Hall or someone that just continued the corruption of previous councils but under the guise of following the rules? If we'd known you'd produce an MLO more loophole laden than the last, we would have preferred it sit in committee for another three decades. We were shocked to see Councilmember Rahman even going so far as to crow about accepting an award from one of the groups while they were actively lobbying her for exemptions. Were the optics of that lost on her? That this behavior is normalized at City Hall is the problem. It confounds us that the LA Fed, literally caught on tape as a bad actor, would have the audacity to push for exemptions and that council members purporting to fight for transparency and the public good would entertain their request. Ron Herrera was not the cause of the problems at the Fed, but rather a symptom of the rotten LA politics. And his resignation does not magically absolve all involved of wrongdoing, nor does it prevent future bad acts. We implore Councilmember Hutt to remember how she felt when she heard her name on the Fed tapes and the cloud that it has brought over her term of service when she considers her stance on these exemptions. It is not the Mid-City Neighborhood Council's opinion that all nonprofit organizations and labor unions are bad. In fact, we enjoy a supportive and collaborative relationship with many. However, it would be naive to believe that the bad apples among the bunch will not take advantage of any loopholes allowed. One only has to look at recent examples. We have former council members in jail or awaiting sentencing while others are on trial, all over their entanglements with lobbyists. The LA Times has recently reported that disgraced council member DeLeon was an unregistered lobbyist while a council member elect and has since failed to recuse himself on matters he had no ethical right to vote on. How many more of you have skeletons in your closets? How many are involved in FBI investigations? How far will this corruption grow without the sunshine of transparency allowed to snuff it out? The proposed 501c5 exemptions do not meet the needs of our beleaguered city and do nothing to promote the public interest nor our faith in you as leaders. The current MLO already allows a tailored exemption for labor unions negotiating their contract with the city. The proposed 501c5 exemptions would exempt all activity, including that which has nothing to do with their contracts, and would exempt labor unions who do not have a contract or proposed contract with the city. A review of the top 20 most populous U.S. cities and the top 10 California cities lobbying laws can find no exemption similar to what is being proposed by Council President. President Kikorian. Those that do have a labor union exemption show that it's carefully tailored around contract negotiations or employee representation and is not nearly as broad as what LA City is suggesting. Labor has the resources and staff to navigate lobbying rules. The LAPPL and the LA Fed are already two of the most powerful entities in LA City politics. They do not need your help. The proposal for 501c3s would not exempt truly nonprofits from reporting duties, which the majority of neighborhood councils filing CISs have advocated for, but would open up wide loopholes. Aside from that, exclusive of some narrow exemptions, nonprofits are currently not exempt from the MLO, so why are we, a city with an alarming current track record for corruption, opening loopholes? 
City Council should not be attempting to create a system in which lobbyists can give them gifts and donations and bundle donations without further reporting. This is indefensible given the LA Fed's role in the leaked Fed tapes in which they conspired to rig our districts and disempower the working class voices they so ardently claim to represent. The argument that lobbyists should be able to be appointed to commission sets the city up for GC 1090 violations. We strongly feel that those whose primary duty is to lobby for their employer do not have a place on commissions and must be treated as lobbyists. We are tired of commissions full of double dealing political appointees. Are you really trying to make the argument that in a city as richly diverse and talented and experienced as Los Angeles, lobbyists are the only option for qualified commissioners? Would it be okay for a lobbyist to be on the Ethics Commission? We already know the LA Fed was pulling the strings on redistricting. Maybe the transparency this committee desires is them openly sitting on the commission. This is not a war against lobbying. Lobbying has a place, but Angelinos deserve transparency and ethics. The city has a black eye and their response should be commiserate with the scope of our problems. The proposed wide ranging exemptions for special interests represent exactly the kind of corruption that neighborhood councils have been so enraged by. That the LA City Council would bend to the whims of some of the most powerful players in LA politics while framing themselves as protecting the common Angelino should be surprising, but it's not. It's what we've come to expect. We dare you to prove us wrong. Thank you for your time and consideration on this topic, the Mid City Neighborhood Council. And I'm sorry, what is your name, please? Jennifer Goody. Thank you. Okay, Chad Boggio, Jamie York, and Kay Hartman, please. Hi, Jamie York. I'm representing the Reseda Neighborhood Council. We have a new community impact statement. Um, in addition, I have my own public comment. Okay. When is a lobbyist not a lobbyist? When the LA City Council finds it politically advantageous to exclude its favored organizations, apparently. That is the premise that comes before you today. Will this body, who desperately needs to earn back the public trust after the leaked Fed tapes, move to weaken long fought for ethics reforms? Or will it remember that the supposed purpose of this body is, quote, restoring the faith of the people in their city government? Our city's government ethics ordinance is exceptionally clear and should serve as the guiding light to restore credibility. Quote, one of the best ways to attract talented people to public service is to assure that the government is respected for its honesty and integrity, that its decisions are made on the merits untainted by any consideration of private gain, and that the rules governing their conduct during and after leaving government service are as clear and complete as possible. A government ethics ordinance that is clear, tough, fair, comprehensive, and effective as any in the nation is therefore needed." End quote. The proposal by Council President Krikorian to exempt 501c3s and 501c3s from the lobbying ordinance undermines that purpose. Twice before, the City Council has allowed recommended updates by the Ethics Commission to die without so much as a vote. And we knew that the likelihood of former current Council President Nuri Martinez scheduling this file was practically non-existent. Nuri was fond of running this city in a way that suited her own love of power. Now that we've been presented with these insulting, backpedaling amendments, we have to wonder if she was the only one more concerned with wielding power than governing the city. Given how her career ended in disgrace, is that really the path that you want to follow? This is why the unpaid elected members of the neighborhood council system whose political lives do not revolve around such practices as donations, fundraising, or independent expenditures took upon it, to do what, took upon it themselves to do what was right because city council would not. In not one of 45 Brown Act compliant meetings did neighborhood council members call for the massive exemption of labor unions or multi-billion dollar 501c3s. Not once did we say that we would love it if paid lobbyists could be exempted to serve on commissions. We did not band together so that we could see the city council spit in our faces and then tell us it's raining. We did this because we are sick of reading story after story about embarrassing ethics violations. Now, at the behest of unregistered backroom lobbying by the LA Fed, which previously lobbied racist council members to rig our districts, lobbied to disenfranchise the voices of renters, lobbied to put Nithya Raman's district in a blender, and lobbied to install a chosen council member in CD10, the city council is suddenly considering a broad exemption for labor that does not exist in any other municipality in the country. Does the city council realize that the LA Fed has not had a lobbyist registered since 2015? That seems a bit improbable. 
This body seems to think that the citizens of Los Angeles are stupid. It seems to think that we aren't paying attention. Our eyes are wide open and we're outraged. Ethics reform is not an acceptable venue for political horse trading. How have you become so lost that you think that this behavior is remotely acceptable? Whose indictment is it going to take for you guys to wake up? None of you are asking the question of whether a nonprofit exemption actually enhances the public good and the public trust. Chicago, in 2019, unanimously, unanimously repealed its nonprofit exemption after the ComEd utility scandal came to light, which implicated numerous nonprofits in their lobbying and bribery scandal. Long Beach is currently considering drastically narrowing their exemption. <coughs> currently, nonprofits frequently lobby the city of LA for contracts worth up to millions of dollars. The potential for conflict of interest and liability is incredibly high, and yet this body seems completely oblivious to those possibilities. You pretend that the actions on the table would benefit the city, but in fact, they would strengthen the interconnected bad behavior we've already seen. Nonprofits and labor lobbyists already work hand in hand with industry lobbying. For instance, the lobbyists with Build With Strength were subject to the largest unregistered lobbying fine in the city's history. However, those same lobbyists were still misrepresenting themselves to neighborhood councils after they signed that stipulation agreement. That same coalition, by the way, includes lobbyists from labor unions and representatives from nonprofits. These are not the union lobbyists seeking to consult the city after their contract or represent their workers in a hearing. They are lobbyists seeking to influence legislation in a way that is financially advantageous. The Reseda Neighborhood Council also cannot forget the Build with Strength Coalition erroneously reported one of their own members to the Ethics Commission in an attempt to silence their voice. <sighs> Thank you. So I have my own co comment. Um, all right. I hate that I have to be here today. I really do. I have major family obligations that are happening. Um, and yeah, here I am. I don't really want to be here. In a world where the city council served the people, MLO reform wouldn't have died twice before. Um, it wouldn't take 45 neighborhood councils coming together to force this issue. In a world where city council served the people, we wouldn't be discussing wider exemptions than anywhere else in the country. The Fed tapes, that was also a lobbying scandal. Kevin DeLeon and AIDS Healthcare, that's a lobbying scandal. USC and MRT, that's a lobbying scandal. Recent examples, these are all recent examples of why labor and large nonprofits shouldn't be in a differing class. The response needs to be commensurate with the scandals before us at hand. Do you think 45 neighborhood councils would have weighed in on a wonky issue if we didn't think that the city was on fire? You're ignoring the voices of regular people in trying to do this. But you know, I, I was really struck during the conversation with the CLA, besides the AI robots thing, which Marquise, totally cool, very on, on with, I like it. Why do we think people don't participate in government? If we look at research, we know that when people don't trust their government, they're more likely to opt out of voting and other types of civic participation. With less, you know, the public feels less empowered when they don't feel like they trust their government. Um, and in turn, the government hears the voices the least of the people that it needs to hear the most. So just a question of, if you do this, it actually is going to affect you know, the rest with the MLO and with redistricting. It's all interconnected, and you need to realize that. Thank you. Chad Boggio, Kay Hartman, Liliana Alonso Maya, please. And I understand Charlie Mims is no longer here, so I'm going to take him off the list. Hello, I'm Kay Hartman. I'm from La Palms Neighborhood Council, but I'm speaking for myself today. Um, under amendments proposed by Council Member Kokorian, this motion is going in the opposite direction from what is needed. If we learn nothing else from the sordid tapes leaked from the meeting of Martinez de Leon, Cedillo, and Herrera, we should have learned that unions have too much influence over the city. 
paid union lobbyists must register and self-identify. They must not be allowed to have seats on the city's commissions. This is a clear conflict of interest. And while there are many 501c3s that do marvelous work, there is plenty of opportunity for mischief. The March 10th article in the LA Times about De Leon and the AIDS Healthcare Foundation makes it clear. To update the MLO such that only a minority of 501c3s have to register and self-identify only opens the door for more skullduggery. I urge the committee to err on the side of transparency. The real danger confronting us is not going far enough. And I want to say that, uh, you know, the Palms Neighborhood Council did have an, um, a, a, a CIS in support, and we have agendized um, opposing based on the amendments. Thank you. Thank you. Chad Boggio, Liliana Alonso Maya, and David Sanders, please. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Liliana Alonso Maya. I'm a senior program manager at Alliance for a Better Community, ABC. ABC works to advance social, economic, racial equity, and justice for the Latino, Latina community in the Los Angeles region. We're also part of our LA coalition form of a dozen community-based organizations, including Inner City Struggle, who is here present, and also Catalyst California. RLA is currently working to, ref uh, to inform residents about the issues of redistricting and council size and gather their input through convenings and surveys. This includes informing and gathering input from residents we work with in the city of Los Angeles, including the San Fernando Valley, Northeast LA, and South LA, which are predominantly Latino, Latina communities, um, and also of indigenous descent, um, like myself. This engagement is important because how these issues get resolved will have a profound impact on, the, on these communities and because these communities have often been marginalized when it comes to this kind of decision making. As the council reviews the CLA report and prepares to take action on behalf of ABC and the communities we serve, we ask for adequate time to ensure that residents are informed about and, um, about and engaged on Thank how you. these structural reforms impact their everyday lives. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Chad Boggio and David Sanders, please. Sorry? Is David Sanders here or David Boggio? I'm sorry, Chad Boggio? Okay, Jessica Panduro, John Daubert, and Kay Hartman already spoke, right? Good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Jessica Panduro. I'm here representing Inner City Struggle and myself as City 14 resident. Uh, Inner City Struggle, we work with you, young adults, parents, and Eastside residents to all lift their voices and advocate for communities from advocating to tenants' rights to resources coming directly to our communities and school. We are renters, we're low-income communities, we're the extremely hardworking communities, extremely. That means that our community residents have two jobs, they're always working, and it's really hard to, to engage with them. That's why we ask you to, as we go into our process, to give time to allow us to really do public education and work with community. Um, our communities are always um, left out of the decision-making process and through all this whole process who they're the most impacted we want to make sure that they have a voice and that they're represented during this process as they mentioned we're part with we are Cal we are LA and one of the main reasons we were part of this program is because we know that as nonprofit organizations or organizations we need to work together to engage with community thank you thank you very much John Daubert and David Sanders please Good afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon, council members. Uh, my name is John Dobard, and I'm here on behalf of Catalyst California. Uh, we are a multiracial organization that advocates for racial justice uh, by working to build community power and transform public institutions. Catalyst California is a member of Our LA, that's uh, Organize, Unite, Reform LA which is a coalition of uh, prim primarily community-based organizations that is working to educate residents uh, across the city about uh, redistricting, 
council size and work to get those residents engaged in the process. Uh, last week, we began the first of five planned convenings across Los Angeles in which trusted messengers uh, will be engaging residents in their native language to discuss governance in the city and potential reforms to ensure that their needs are reflected in government. Uh, through direct feedback in convenings and surveys, we're gathering input from hundreds of low-income residents of color whose voices may not otherwise be heard. We plan to analyze and share that feedback over the coming months. As the council reviews the CLA report and prepares to take action, we ask for adequate time to ensure that residents are informed about and engaged on how these structural reforms impact their everyday lives. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, all right, were there uh, any other speakers who had signed up whose names I did not call here in the council chambers? Uh, I don't see any, so we can go ahead and proceed to the first caller on the phone, please. Speaker, which items would you like to speak on? I would like to speak on all of them. Okay, please go ahead. I uh, live in the CD2 Krikorian uh, district, and uh, my public comment is, you know, with the city still plagued and dealing with the scandal involving Nuri Martinez, Gil Cedillo, uh, Herrera, and Kevin De Leon, it is absolutely batshit crazy to try and push these ordinance and these exemptions that would only harm and essentially do nothing to address the problems and the distrust that the city council is plagued with, right? It's no surprise that Paul Krikorian is largely behind this measure because Paul Krikorian, honestly, it's surprising that you weren't in that room because you may as well have been in that room because you seem to support everything that they talked about. You seem to be pushing the things that Nuri Martinez herself probably would be pushing for had she not been caught up in that scandal. Again, and to what a lot of other public speakers and commenters have already uh, addressed, this is only reaffirming people's distrust of this body. It's only making people more and more detached from wanting to get involved because they see you all as compromised and as nothing more as empty suits representing the interests of big money, the police association and their gang, and interests that do, that do not reflect their own. And so I would hope that this body starts listening to the people, starts listening to neighborhood council, and actually starts doing something that fucking helps the community, that actually helps these marginalized people, that actually helps restore trust in the government. Right, but instead, we're here having to spend two hours listening to a presentation that we essentially can't really even comment on and won't be even voted on, which I feel is used to lull people to sleep because half the room is now empty and I'm sure a lot of callers have had to go on with the rest of their day, which, you Thank know, you, knowing Paul Krikori. Caller, which items would you like to speak on? Um, all available items. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Jillian Burgos, and I'm from the NoHo Neighborhood Council speaking on my behalf. Uh, the public deserves transparency. Over 40 neighborhood councils agree that we should have a right to know if a lobbyist is speaking before a neighborhood council, commission, or city council. Lobbyists have come before our neighborhood council under the veil of a big concerned neighbor or an entity wanting to help our neighborhood. One such lobbyist spent several weeks emailing me and saying that they wanted to help the most disenfranchised in our community obtaining services. It wasn't until we did some deep digging that we realized that they were a lobbyist. This is duplicitous intent and cannot be tolerated. Every other major city employs a model for determining who is a lobbyist, but why does not LA? There is no blanket exemption for small nonprofits that invite special interests to create and utilize front groups to engage in, in lobbying, completely scot free from regulation under the MLO. They do not have the best interest for our communities because they are more concerned about a paycheck. We need full disclosure, otherwise we will be idly standing by and allowing one loophole to be closed while creating a new one. I wanted to shout out every NC council member who showed up or called in, thank you so much. We are volunteers with no special interest. Our only interest is helping the community. And also a big thank you to Jamie York for all of her hard work. 
Um, a truly independent redistricting commission is needed and should be devoid of any ties to current or future elected officials. It is disheartening to hear that our council district two was gerrymandered to support a certain candidate for the 2024 election long before any candidate could declare their candidacy. This is a dangerous precedent with a goal to silence a goal to silence the people of LA in a backroom deal. Let's call it what it is: voter suppression. And those who are involved, whether they were present in that room or not, should be removed from the council or from holding future office. Elections should be determined by voters, not by politicians who are concerned about their careers. Thank you so much for your time, and have a good day. Thank you. Next speaker. Caller, which items would you like to speak on? Yes, I'd like to speak on one and two. Great, you have two minutes, please begin. Hello, uh, this is Sean McMorris with California Common Cause. For item number one, we uh, thank the Office of the Chief Legislative Analyst for their extensive report on Independent Redistricting Commission. Uh, California Common Cause looks forward to working with the City Council to help create a meaningful and completely independent IRC in Los Angeles that observes map drawing criteria that is community-centered, follows an application and map drawing process that is transparent, inclusive, and participatory, and embraces a charter language that can responsibly evolve while maintaining the commission's independence. Regarding item, regarding item number two, California Common Cause opposes this committee's new amendments to the draft MLO unless they are amended to completely remove 501c5s from exemption and additional checks are implemented on 501c3 as outlined in our co-signed letter to the committee. It is troubling that these significant amendments have been added to the draft MLO in the 11th hour and essentially out of the public's purview. This does not engender trust in the city's reform process. The Ethics Commission and the public have engaged extensively over the last several years to present this committee with progressive amendments to the city's MLO, only to have those efforts cast aside due to what appears to be backroom lobbying, the very thing that an updated MLO is meant to better address. For the sake of public trust in the reform process and in city government, we hope this committee will implement the amendments requested in our co-signed letter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Caller, which items would you like to speak on? Hello? Hi, which items would you like to speak on? Hi, item two, please. Please go ahead. I'm Nona Randwa. Thank you. I'm Nona Randwa, a resident of CD14, here in my role as General Counsel of Alliance for Justice, a national 501c3 committed to creating a just and equitable society for all. Our Boulder Advocacy Program provides legal support to nonprofits to help them advocate while staying in compliance with a variety of complex rules that apply to them when they do so. We have provided free support to hundreds of nonprofits in LA over the last eight years, including helping them comply with the LA MLO. 501c3 public charities are unique. We are prohibited from taking too much money from any one source, banned from supporting candidates for office, can only do an insubstantial amount of lobbying and must report all lobbying publicly to the IRS, albeit under somewhat different definitions and in all jurisdictions. For many years, grassroots 501c3s have worked to bring a public voice to City Hall. The new MLO by drastically lowering the threshold for who has to register, especially for grassroots activity, and eliminating an exemption for 501c3s providing services to underrepresented communities places new barriers. Thank you. Hi, are you there, Speaker? I think you dropped off. Okay, we'll move on to the next speaker. Caller, which items would you like to speak on? Hi, I'd like to speak on item number two. My name is Cynthia Strathman. I'm the Executive Director of Strategic Actions for a Just Economy and 501c3 from South Central LA that serves extremely low income mostly monolingual Spanish-speaking immigrant tenants. Age is concerned, as are many other 501c3s who serve low-income communities of color, about regulating nonprofits as though we were special interest groups when we are prohibited from taking too much money from any one source and banned from supporting elected officials. It is important to distinguish between 501c3s and C4s, C5s, and C6s. For years, Sage and other grassroots 501c3s have worked to bring a public voice to development in contrast to the for-profit developers who wanted to subvert public processes for their own profit. 
These same developers have been at the heart of recent city hall scandals. To have the agencies who have done more than anyone else in this city to call those developers to account now restrained in their activities through onerous administrative and reporting requirements under the cloak of addressing corruption is ironic, to say the least. We need more public participation in City Hall, not less, and the primary vehicle for many people from low-income communities of color in L.A. are grassroots 501 c 3 Unlike the English-speaking middle-class homeowners who historically have weighed in so often. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Caller, which items would you like to speak on? Lower income residents often do not have the social capital or know how to engage in civic matters. Caller, which items would you like to speak on? Hi, my name is Adele Slaughter. Can you hear me? We sure can. Which items would you like to speak on? I'm speaking on one and two, but I won't speak that long. Please go ahead. Um, I'm, I'm from the, I'm a member of the Studio City Neighborhood Council, but I'm speaking for myself. That's, and I'm in CD4, not CD2. Um, I just wanted to say <clears throat> that Einstein said something like, the mind that houses the problem is not the mind that can solve it. And it seems to me that what you guys are trying to do right now is trying to gain trust, but you're using the same mind that has been trying to gain trust for the last several years and hasn't done it. You won't get young people to participate with the, with the same mind that you've been using. And I really do also want to reach out and do surveys and get more younger participation, but we need to be able to trust city council. Um, um, I think loopholes for people for 501c3s, and I don't really think that the um, administration is that difficult to, to do the lobbyist administration. It's not that hard. And so what we need is integrity in our government, integrity in the people who come and talk to us and who lobby for things. And we need to know that. That's all we want to know that. And so um, I think that the impulse that uh, Paul Kukorian had to exempt certain people was a good impulse, but I think it has too many loopholes and has too many problems, and it's the same mind that we've been using. Um, I simply agree with uh, Jamie York's comments, she, very well researched and very in depth. And I think that uh, um, I support her and what she has said. And um, thank you so much for being here. And thank you for, do, for being open. And thank you for trying. And I also agree with what Nithya Raman said about you know, needing to reach out to younger people and not just all of us um, retired people. But um, I, and I'm willing to work on that with you. So thank you. Thanks. Caller, which items would you like to speak on? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Which items would you like to speak on? Item one, please. You have a minute. Please begin. Hi, council members. My name is Wong Wen. I'm the director of external affairs for AHI Equity Alliance. We are a coalition of over 40 nonprofit organizations serving the AHI communities throughout Los Angeles County. We are also a member of Our LA, a recently formed coalition of a dozen community-based organizations working to ensure that the voices and concerns of residents impacted by the racist systems in the city of LA to inform the governance and reform process. Our LA is currently working to inform and gather input from residents uh, that we work with in the Asian Pacific Islander communities. This will obviously take some time, and we would appreciate it if the council could hold off on making any decisions until we have presented our community feedback, and we're glad to hear that that's going to happen. Uh, but in addition, the community input process should happen in partnership with community-based organizations with expertise and trusted relationships. Thank you. Thank you. Caller, which items would you like to speak on? Hi, I'd like to speak on all available items, please. You have two minutes. Please begin. Great. Thank you. My name is Sasha Harnden. I'm a senior policy advocate with the Inner City Law Center. Um, I'd like to encourage you, with respect to the municipal lobbying ordinance, to slow down and ensure adequate input 
from grassroots groups that fill the city's gaps with respect to equity and engaging underrepresented constituents. This ordinance has massive implications for how Angelinos engage with public policy and the administration of local policies. Um, and once again, we've not had a meaningful opportunity uh, to review proposed changes with stakeholders and you know, take community input and respond. There is a massive distinction between seeking city funds or contracts or giving gifts and campaign contributions and helping your constituents navigate city services, programs, and policies, and report out to you all on those experiences to help troubleshoot issues as they arise or help underrepresented constituents provide input on issues that concretely affect their lives. There is no question to me that large bad actors with money will have no problem navigating this ordinance, but the rules being put forth could massively undermine civic engagement, which seems like the opposite of the goal here. Um, you know, a good example is tenant organizers across this city doing deep work to let renters who lack power, who were implicated in these tapes, you know, there was very much a theme to intentionally deny power from renters as part of, you know, what has led to today's hearing. Um, and yet the folks who work to restore that power and to inform those tenants and allow them to engage in the city processes or troubleshoot, you know, issues that could arise with the LAHD complaint process, for example, um, those are the voices that will be shut out, you know, by the complication of having to register now as lobbyists and report on all of that activity. Thank you. Um, Thanks. Next speaker. Caller, which items would you like to speak on? Items one and two. You have two minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Glenn Bailey, uh, mostly speaking as an individual. Uh, regarding redistricting, uh, I, I'm involved with uh, the neighbor council system, uh, you know, both regionally and citywide. And, you know, I think neighbor councils were probably in a mindset for waiting till 2030 for the, you know, many were engaged as last time. So my first comment is in terms of involvement, I appreciate uh, Chairman Kokorian indicating six meetings, but um, I just want to let you know that for most neighbor councils, this ha this has not hit their radar screen. So um, I'm not sure where it should come from. It, it could come from Councilman Kokorian as chair of the committee, but an e-blast out uh, could come from the Department of Neighbor Empowerment, giving the neighbor councils a heads up on this effort as soon as possible so that they can get it on their agenda. Some have, but most have not. Um, so I think that's the most important comment on the redistricting, just in terms, of, and also engaging the alliances of neighbor councils, you know, that, that is less than the 99 uh, separate meetings. Um, secondly, with regards to municipal lobbying ordinance, um, both the Northridge East Neighbor Council and the Encino Neighbor Council have filed community impact statements. Northridge East submitted theirs you know, at your last meeting, I don't think Encino did, but I won't take time to do that now. Um, but I do want to indicate, um, you know, I was open-minded to uh, Councilman Corian addressing the nonprofit issue. I serve on the board of two 501c3 nonprofits. We don't lobby the city, but if we do, I think that we should fall under uh, strict disclosure regulations. I totally would agree with waiving the fees especially for those of us that, you know, have smaller budgets, you know, of 50,000 or 100,000. Um, so waive the fees, but definitely require disclosure because you don't want to create another loophole whereby um, other special interests- Thank you, it could Speaker. Be Thank you. Caller, which items would you like to speak on? Caller with the last four digits, 2070, please press star six to unmute. Okay, maybe we'll go to the next speaker. Can I speak on both items, please? Oh yes, there you are. Yes, you may, please go ahead. You have two minutes. Thank you, my name is Lee. I'm part of the Encino Neighborhood Council, but I'm speaking on behalf of myself today. Uh, first and foremost, uh, for the MLO, 
I think Jamie's comments um, were right on point. You know, you, you can't say that you're going to go ahead and clean up the city while at the same time give special access to people and allow them special avenues that are by definition restricted to other folks, especially if they don't qualify to be part of those lobbying organizations. The true good ones we can evaluate on whether or not these can be lifted, but <laughs> to flat out allow exemption in the interest of non-transparency completely should absolutely not be allowed. As far as redistricting goes, Encino was left without an incumbent uh, council member during the redistricting where our interests um, were not even pushed. And what I would suggest that folks take into account is to create a population formula that automatically equates to the number of council districts. So we don't have to discuss the numbers. Let's just look at it from a pure ideological point. At how many persons per representative is too much? Codify that, put that in the charter, and then that'll trigger an automatic addition of council seats without backdoor deals, without shenanigans, and without racist manipulations by different folks. And lastly, you should have things that are added in there when you pick the folks after a screening process, obviously they have to be residents for a certain amount of years and what have you. Names get drawn out of a hat. Really hard to rig one of those hats. And Thank you. Caller, which items would you like to speak on? Caller, which items would you like to speak on? A general public comment, please. There is no general public comment. Do you want to speak to either of the items on the agenda? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, both items, please. Excuse me. I couldn't understand that. Would you say that again? Both items, please. Please go ahead. So I just want to point out a couple things. Firstly, we just had a chief legislative analysis, Mr. Wick, I think it was his name, go through a more than two hour presentation. The latter portion discussing how to engage members of the public, right? Yet I, I can't help but note Krikorian's absent from his chair. Raman's been on her phone. Dawson looks like he's taking a nap. I haven't seen any council members take notes on anything any constituent actually has to say, um, which is very disappointing. And I just want to recall, uh, we are an Englander indicted by the FBI, which is what it took to prosecute the criminal activity, something the Ethics Commission should be doing. It has taken the FBI to do their jobs. So, I'm sorry? I didn't say anything. Please continue. Oh, sorry, I think there's, there's an echo. Uh, the city has authority to write its own rules for appointed commissioners for the Ethics Commission when really this is a body that needs to be an independent body. The, the, the FBI is what it took for them to prosecute quote unquote unethical behavior. It would be nice if the council members started to, you know, at least make it look like you're listening, make it look like you're paying attention to the comments. Thanks. Thank you. Caller, which items would you like to speak on? Hi, this is Donald Harlan in Los Angeles. I'd like to speak on agenda item number one and two. Go ahead. And Mr. a general comment. Please. There is no general com public comment, but you have two minutes more, Mr. Harlan, for the items. Please continue. Okay, uh, agenda item number one, the redistricting. I want you guys to consider that uh, there, there could be a political favor involved in this uh, also an attempt to steal tax revenue uh if they're going to uh try and rearrange the lines to try and redistribute money or redistribute people and their pyramid schemes you know one pyramid scheme for another uh also consider that redistricting at this point might be do being done is being done because the mayor asked for it Put it, tell them that it's out in the tell the mayor it's out in the public that 
The mayor asked for redistricting for her personal favor, for her political ambition. That it's in the public. We Donald said so. Um, to uh, fill it, tell us what's going on and what you guys are really up to. Uh, you know, uh, there's. Uh, I want you to consider the the put under agenda item one the redistricting. Um, I want you to consider uh, the political campaign lawyers involved in this. Uh, I'm going to give you the monster of the day. Gibson Dunn, there is a law, law agency that's uh, involved in political campaign. Also consider that uh, the problem isn't just the, the problem of the corruption in the city caused by the political campaigns. Um, agenda item number two, uh, the labor unions, uh, about the lobbyists from the labor unions, no kidding. The labor unions put some of the most evil people in the government uh, that uh, they're, uh, they, these guys, they, you know, and then when you guys bust somebody out of the LSA council, you know what happens? They're out of jail in five years, and then they're living in the illegal real estate development that they got busted for. Uh, consider the labor unions, consider this. Uh, General Lee showed up to Congress with Thank the... Thank you, Mr. Harland. Caller, which items would you like to speak on? Uh, item two, please. You have a minute. Please begin. Fred Sutton with the California Apartment Association. I'm a registered lobbyist with the city. The association is supportive of expanding the applicability of the city's lobbying ordinance to include interest groups which are currently exempt from registering. Groups that are actively working to affect legislative outcomes have an organizational structure, paid employees, and funding to support their respective objectives should register their activities. This is particularly true when the desired legislation has potentially negative impacts on other constituencies. Nonprofit does not necessarily mean the entity and employees are not self-interested. The law is intended to ensure the public is aware of who is being paid by what organization to influence lawmakers. The city should do everything to minimize administrative burden, encourage organic civic engagement, while ensuring registration requirements are not selective. Thank you for your work and deliberation on this important issue. Thank you. Caller, which items would you like to speak on? Caller with the last four digits, 4157. Please press star 610 mute. Hello, um, my name is David and I'm submitting public comment on item one. Sure, you have a minute, please go ahead. I'm a representative of Inner City Struggle. We work with youth and community in CD14 to ensure that each person in our community is respected and represented when it comes to who speaks for us in uh, city council. And so as a member of our LA, we wanna ask for more time from the city uh, council before taking action on the Seattle Labor Report so that we can ensure our communities have their voices heard. We uh, want to ensure residents engage on how these structural reforms impact their lives. Many of our residents in CD14 feel that they no longer trust city council and the more time that we can take to speak to our community about these re reforms is going to positively change the way that our communities vote and give uh, their input in structural reform. And so we want more time to collect um, communities' input and we ask um, city council to give us, uh, our community more time. Thank you. Caller, which items would you like to speak on? Item one. Hi, I think you said item one, in which case you have a minute, please begin. Listen up, NCs. More city council members means more bureaucracy and corruption. This in turn means higher taxes and less services. We need to take a global perspective and seek examples of high performing cities. For example, what are cities like Singapore and Zurich doing well? Moreover, due to the size of our city, we should make city councils, neighborhood councils like the House of Representatives controlling the purse and the city council like the Senate ratifying the ideas. And finally, I hear words of inclusion, but witness continued actions of Latino exclusion. 
The banter tapes were attempting to correct historical anti-Latino districting. Latinos are the majority in Los Angeles with more than 48% of the population, greater than all major ethnic groups combined, yet they only make 14% of this committee. A majority held in restraint by constitutional checks and limitations is the only true sovereign of a free people. Whoever rejects it does of necessity fly to anarchy or to despotism. Only united together can we make this city the best in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Caller, which items would you like to speak on? Caller with the last five, four digits, 7825. Please press star six to unmute. Caller with the digits 7825. If you're there, please press star six or we will have to move on. All right, uh, uh, I'm here. Great, which items do you want to speak on? Can you hear me? Uh, all available items. That would be two minutes for the two items. Please begin. Are you there, speaker? Please begin. Can, can, you, can you hear me now? I was uh, muted for some uh, reason. We can hear you now, so please begin. Okay, thank you. This is DJ Frank. I'm with the Receipt of Council speaking as an individual. Um, I would just like to say uh, on item one, an independent redistricting commission is actually absolutely imperative. We saw in this last redistricting how our city council member through his uh, crony uh, Commissioner Katz tried to make a district that was extremely friendly to him, and then when it got thrown back to the city council, actually ended up uh, creating di a district which uh, eliminated his only viable opponent in uh, the recent election to guarantee that he would get reelected, uh, and plus split my community in half, uh, which is, uh, could be a very detrimental result. So the re independent redistricting is extremely important. Regarding the 501, uh, the exemptions on the municipal lobbying organs, no exemptions should be allowed. Everyone should be on the same uh, playing field, especially on the level of the neighborhood councils. The transparency on what people are representing is absolutely imperative. I don't know why anyone, unless they've got ulterior motives, would be against that. Um, in my own uh, community and neighborhood council, I've seen how our councilman has occasionally uh, packed neighborhood council meetings with uh, advocates and lobbyists who don't identify themselves, confuse the uh, neighborhood council members who aren't exactly experienced in these cynical maneuverings that's done by the city and uh, city politicians, and fooled into going along with schemes that are deleterious to the community. So no exemptions for the 501c3s and 501c5s groups. Um, this, uh, at the neighborhood council level, it's extremely important that we know who's coming into our meetings and talking to us so we know how to properly represent and advocate the people who are living. Thank you. Caller, which items would you like to speak on? Speaker, which items do you want to speak on? Speaker, which items do you want to speak on? There are no more callers in the queue. Oh, all right. He hung up. Okay. So we have exhausted every speaker in the room who wanted to speak and every speaker on the phone who ca called in. Everybody who requested to speak in public comment at this speaking meeting, Mr. President, has had an opportunity to do so. All right, thank you very much. Thanks to everyone uh, for participating in this discussion. Uh, we'll go ahead and bring up item number two now, please. Item number two is an ad hoc committee on city governance reform report relative to updates to the municipal lobbying ordinance, consideration of revised proposed ordinance. This is continued from the ad hoc committee on city governance reform meeting of March 6, 2023. And this item has been waived from the Rules, Elections, and Intergovernmental Relations Committee. All right. Uh, thank you very much. If I could ask the representatives of the Ethics Commission to come on up uh, to the front table, because I think there's going to be uh, a number of questions that members are going to have. Um, but uh, uh, before we do that, I, I guess I just want to 
clarify a little bit what we're doing today. Uh, this is the first comprehensive amendment of the municipal lobbying ordinance in many years. Um, it brings before this committee uh, some reforms that have sat on a shelf uh, for a long time. Uh, it increases the ability to enforce the municipal lobbying ordinance against professional lobbying organizations that too often now uh, evade their responsibilities under the MLO because of the way that the trigger point of uh, being required to register uh, is, is currently under the law. Uh, and it makes, uh, so it makes the job of the Ethics Commission in enforcing uh, the requirements of the MLO significantly easier and more effective. Um, the pro as we have engaged in the process of doing that, um, it had other uh, results and consequences, one of which was to sweep many other uh, types of entities, which I don't think most people associate as being lobbying firms, uh, within the scope of the lobbying ordinance, like many of our neighborhood nonprofit organizations and so on. Um, at the same time, the neighborhood councils in particular, um, I thought raised some really important points about people not identifying who they really are. And, uh, you know, in the case of nonprofits, in the case of labor unions, in the case of professional lobbyists, in, in all of those cases, that should never be permitted. It should never be permitted that someone who is being paid uh, to advocate for anything within this city uh, should be able to uh, pretend that they're someone who they are not uh, or avoid identifying the fact that they are there as a paid representative. So what we tried to do with these proposed changes is accommodate um, the need for reform of the MLO, the need to increase the Ethics Commission's uh, ability to enforce the MLO, while also addressing that concern to ensure that everybody identifies themselves correctly as a paid representative who's advocating for anything in front of the, the city. And that's where we came up with the concept of the nonprofit filer. That being said, these are related, but in my view, clearly distinguishable issues. Um, the lobbying firm that gets paid to exercise its influence is a different category of issues than uh, a nonprofit organization that advocates 100% of the time for a particular issue. It, these are very distinguishable um, uh, types of entities. On the one hand, you have somebody who is being paid solely because of their influence in being able to uh, move government to you know, the position of whoever is paying them. And then on the other hand, you have people who are doing important work uh, for our community, um, whether you agree with their cause or not, um, who are trying to advocate for issues that are clearly identifiable as being the representatives of those issues. It's a very different situation than when Joe Smith shows up uh, and uh, argues for something without ever identifying who's actually paying them to, to be there. So. I mean, they may be somewhat related, but still, we have the difficult job as policymakers, not of just, you know, painting with a broad brush, but of actually distinguishing limes from lemons. You know, yes, they're both citrus, but they're different. And I think we have a situation here where we have two different categories of issues. So um, that's, you know, the thinking that's behind uh, the, the proposal, the proposed amendments uh, that I have put before you. Um, and I will say, you know, some of the folks who spoke here during public comment uh, spoke to that issue of, of not identifying uh, who, who the person is who's speaking. Um, that will not be allowed under these ordinances, uh, under this amended ordinance. Whether you are a nonprofit, whether you are a labor union, whether you are a professional lobbying organization. Um, this ordinance will require identification of who you are, what you're doing there, and who's paying you. And so uh, that those issues should be considered off the table. 
But at the same time, I mean, some of the public commenters seem to be motivated just by the desire to reduce influence by certain sectors of the nonprofit community. And that should not be our goal. Um, that, that, that in itself is not a goal that we should be pursuing. I'm not, I for one, am not going to try to cut the legs out of those who are speaking up on behalf of tenants or working people or many of, uh, of the other causes that are represented by either the labor unions or the nonprofit organizations that we're talking about. If that's your goal, to just cut their legs out and weaken them, then I don't share your goal. And I don't think that is the point of a municipal lobbying ordinance in the first place. So um, I, I just can't imagine a situation where we would want to take away the constitutional rights of people because they happen to work for a nonprofit organization. I, I just don't see what public objective is being served. I can't imagine a situation where the city is better served uh, if our you know, Urban Forestry Advisory Council is not allowed to have an employee of tree people sitting on it. Uh, or I could think of countless other examples, including commissions that we have that are dedicated to labor management relations to, to think that we would not be able to have a, a union employee on those, it's, it's actually impossible to imagine. And it's counterproductive to, uh, I think, the objectives that we're, we're all trying to strive for. So, um, I, members, I would just urge you, avoid the broad brush, avoid the big rush of um, you know, enthusiasm that we get once we, we start doing some of these things. Uh, that causes us very often to lose sight of actual distinctions. You know, let's, let's focus on the actual distinctions. And, and I think that the carefully drafted language that's before you, and I think the amendment that Ms. Rahman is proposing as well, are thoughtful ways uh, to try to delineate um, different issues that are, some are trying to just wrap up into one solution. And, uh, you know, we don't make the best policy when we try and stick square pegs in round holes. So uh, with that, I want to um, open the floor to questions to the Ethics Commission. I have a few, but I can come later if members would like to uh, be heard either on the language or ask questions to the Ethics Commission. Uh, Mr. Blumenfield. Sure. Um, well, part of the issue that we have, and it sort of starts as a comment, is that, I mean, all of us want anyone who is speaking to disclose if they're paid a dime. Um, we, the easiest thing for us to do would be to just pass a rule that says anyone who speaks has to disclose uh, if they're being paid at all or receiving any compensation. As I understand it, we can't actually do that uh, directly because of both First Amendment and the Brown Act. Um, we can't even require people to tell us their, uh, their real name. Uh, so it becomes difficult to do that, but we all want to do that. So we have a little bit of a of leeway in this lobbying ordinance where we can, because we can require lobbyists to disclose. Um, so we're trying to put a square peg in a round hole because a lobbyist is paid by different groups to say different things. And we have nonprofits and unions and others that we want to know if they are being paid and disclosed, but we, we they're not, they're not being paid by different groups to say different things. They always stick with their, their mission. So how do we do that? And what I'm seeing that's coming up here, which I think makes sense, is we try to capture them under a lobbyist light or a, what is called a, a nonprofit filer. Uh, but I also want to, you know, if, when people say that we're creating a, a loophole, I want to I drill down because I certainly don't want to create any loopholes. But, Please help me understand all the things that this nonprofit filer would be required to do. Chief among them, and the most important, is the disclosure. Is that correct? What, what, what are the things that lobbyists have to do that a nonprofit filer doesn't have to do that, that people might be worked up about? Good afternoon, uh, council members. Uh, David Tristan with the Ethics Commission, and joining me is Heather Holt, our Deputy Executive Director, and uh, Tyler Joseph, our Director of Policy. Uh, in terms of the disclosure, there's roughly about 20 items that a lobbyist reports on a quarterly report 
uh, under the proposal, the nonprofits would be disclosing about a third of that. The, the, main sub, the main topics that they would be disclosing, the main issues would be uh, who spoke before a city committee or department, the item that they're uh, lobbying on, uh, and the issue, the particular issue, um, and whether they're supporting it and opposing it. So I think it captures the majority of the issue that in terms of the, their activity, whether the, whether it be the item that they're supporting or opposing or the issue. So in the previous discussions that we had, I think the focus was try in an attempt to try to collect as much information as we could. But many of the items there won't be applicable to the nonprofits or the unions given the disclosure requirements. I could go through the entire list if you want me to. I think you guys have heard a lot of information already today with related um, to. Uh, I'm just trying to establish and be responsive to the, you know, is listening carefully to all the comments and, and people are concerned about somehow that we are lightening the load on, you know, we're, we're creating a, a loophole and, and I'm not seeing that because I'm seeing us capture the most important information. And so that's why I'm asking you, well, what, what is the information that we're not capturing that someone would be concerned about? Because the, the one that we've all talked about is the disclosure, and, and we're not lessening the disclosure at all. Is that correct? Well, I, th I think the important thing to, to note is the, the threshold for registration will be the same for both of them. They both will have a $5,000 threshold um, to uh, determine whether they have to register and report. That is different than the exemptions that currently exist. Um, in terms of the types of things that they wouldn't have to disclose. The exemptions that currently exist have to do with hours. It will be hours, but also it was depending on the type of work that they do. There was a broad exemption that um, allowed nonprofits uh, to exempt themselves from having to disclose what they do if they are directly providing services to indigent individuals. Right, which is a great thing, although I don't know how it survives legal scrutiny. I mean, Correct. Obviously it has, but. The categorical uh, exemptions are gone. They are all now going to be treated under the $5,000 threshold, including nonprofit filers. So that is a big distinction. And is that, is that the reason we're getting rid of the categoricals? <coughs> is, uh, I'm assuming is that, is that because of the legal uh, precarity of that? No, I think that was uh, the council committee's recommendation in terms of trying to treat everyone as similarly situated as possible and to make the tracking of it uh, easier for us. Uh, in terms of the nonprofits, they don't track, uh, they won't have to register individuals, but the nonprofit itself will. Okay. Um, different topic about, and, and I'm looking at the uh, amendment, which, which I like generally, but the, the, the second part of it says required nonprofit filers to disclose the same information regarding gifts, contributions, funding activity, and solicitations as lobbyists. Um, how much of that do we already do? Well, in terms of the nonprofits and the unions, they, there isn't much that they report related to that. It depends on the type of activity that, that they're having. Most of their campaign-related activity happens on the independent expenditure side. Uh, we don't see many direct contributions, and if they do exist, they're going to be limited to the current contribution limit that applies. So if a nonprofit or a union wanted to make a direct contribution, they can make one to one candidate subject to the contribution limits. Most of the campaign activity, like I said, in that arena happens on the independent expenditure side, and that is reported under our current laws within 24 hours if they exceed $1,000 or more. Right, and, and obviously contributions are reported directly. Correct. We all have to report any contributions that we get immediately. Um, Correct. And, and if a union or a nonprofit did conduct any of that activity, our 24-hour reports require them to disclose um, the contributions through that, through that process. Yeah, I'm just trying to drill down if it was the belt and suspenders or if there was something different, like the uh, disclosing the same information regarding gifts and fundraising activities, lobbyists are not allowed to do those things anyway. Correct. So they can fundraise. They, they can can't fund make gifts, they can't make uh, political contributions, but they, they, they can fundraise. Okay, so when you, it's, when you disclose the same information regarding gifts, if you, well, that doesn't matter because they can't give gifts. Contributions is the legal part. Fundraising activities maybe, is that, that's the, that's the drill down, but that would be the addition, right? The nonprofit filers would have to disclose their Correct. fundraising activities, meaning if they, you know, how do you do, how do, you do that? 
if they had a fundraiser for a candidate, on quarterly reports, they would disclose the amount of fund, the date and the amount of fundraising activity that they had for a particular candidate. That's how it's currently done by, by other lobbyists. Yeah. Okay. Great. I'll, co I'll come back to this. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Rahman, did yes. you want to be heard? I, you know, I just wanted to talk about my amendment for a moment. I also wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, <clears throat> where we are right now. Um, and how we got here and I think what, what we have to grapple with are steps forward. I'm not sure if there will be a lot of questions, but I, do, I feel like I need to make a couple comments. You know, I think a lot of people have talked about this, but we, we, we are for the first time since the original lobbying ordinance was passed thir 30 years ago talking about making changes to it. That's a big deal. Um, and, and, you know, it's, I wrote a letter to the Ethics Commission in April of 2022 about your recommendations, making some additional changes, and encouraging all of us to consider them and to pass them. And then after that, uh, there wasn't much purchase for that in the city, but then we had the largest crisis moment for trust in city government in a generation, or maybe a couple generations, I don't know. Um, and then I think this had softer ground to move forward, which is, which is you know, it's. I'm glad we're having this conversation now. I wish it hadn't taken a crisis for us to get here, but, it's, but it is exciting that we're having this conversation now. And I think a lot of the updates that are in here are necessary, they're overdue, they're gonna improve our current public engagement system a lot. Um, and so overall, you know, despite the fact that I think we can make some changes to the current proposals in front of us that can improve them, I'm happy we're here. It took us a long time to get here and I'm happy we're here. I think some of the challenges with what we're considering right now, there's some, there's some benefits, right? So like we take away the service provider exemption that was there and certain organizations that wouldn't have had to, that would have had to register their lobbyists but wouldn't have had to register their own conversations with the city are now going to have to do that. AHF, which has been in the news about recently, is, is one where I think they'll now have to, to talk about their conversations with City Hall in a way that they wouldn't before, and that's, that's exciting to me. But I think some of the changes also blur the distinctions between nonprofits in ways that I think are, um, I think are rightly a little bit challenging. Like I think comparing a smaller nonprofit, a neighborhood level nonprofit to a USC or a Kaiser, those are two very different entities. And what we have before us treats them both the same way. And I think a lot of the nonprofits that have been calling in and asking for us to make this process as easy for them as possible. And I know a number of my colleagues and I have been involved closely in nonprofits before and understand how hard it is for nonprofits to make their payroll and raise their dollars, also want to make it as easy as possible for nonprofits to be able to register under these guidelines and to be able to report their work. And yet what we're also doing because of the way in which this is set up is to make it the same, just as easy for a gigantic nonprofit like, like a USC or a, um, a Kaiser to also fall under those uh, guidelines. And I think the blurring of those kinds of entities you know, to me, I don't know, it's, it's a little challenging for me. I think we can, um, I can work with this, <laughs> but I think it, 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 it is a little bit challenging. And I also think that we're lumping two different categories of, of um, organizations into the same uh, bucket. We're lumping both the nonprofits and labor into the same bucket. And I think that to me also poses some challenges. They operate very differently in our city. They engage with the city really differently. And right now in this current set of regulations, and I just, I, w I do wanna say, Council President, that I really appreciate the thoughtfulness of, of this approach. I think it addresses some of the concerns that we had earlier, but I, I, I'm still having trouble kind of pulling apart how these rules will impact the ways in which labor engages with city decision making and city officials. Um, and that's in part because, I, you know, I'll say I still, like, I've been here for two years and change. Um, and 
I think it's still a surprise to me how much labor and City Hall are intertwined, despite the fact that I read about it, despite the fact that I knew about it before. Um, and I would love for these rules to grapple a little bit more with that engagement and a little bit more deeply. But I do want to say that I think that the amendments that I put forward, you said that the, the you know, differences between nonprofit filers and lobbyists, uh, nonprofit filers would have about a third of the reporting requirements, right? Is that, that's what you just said. The amendments that I put forward, I think, bring that up to about half, half or a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And some of the other changes, uh, some of the other things that lobbyists have to report are not things that nonprofit filers would have expenditures on, like these are salaries paid to lobbyists and things like that. And so I think, you know, I'm still, I'm still grappling with this, to be honest with you. I haven't, um, I, I'm still trying to wrap my, uh, wrap my thinking around how this captures the ways in which these different entities that engage with and influence City Hall, how these rules impact that engagement and, and bring greater transparency to it in a way that can really help us understand who's influencing decision making at the city. Uh, but I do think that these amendments bring us closer to um, closer to greater, some of that greater transparency that I think is really necessary. So I think I just, that was more of a comment, I guess, than a question, but yeah. Mr. Harris Dawson. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. And I, I want to uh, recognize Council President and uh, Councilwoman Rahman in particular for bringing uh, this before us to facilitate this uh, conversation that is impossible to have without upsetting lots of people. Um, so thank you uh, for that. But it's one that the city desperately needs to have had uh, long before now, and it's absolutely imperative that we have it now. I really want to zero in on the, the, the small nonprofits, also associate my, myself with the comments of, of Mr. Kikorian and Ms. Raman, where, you know, one of my big sticklers, we treat things that are very different as if they're the same. So we treat Kaiser like we treat the Girl Scout troop down the street. There's, it, because they both have the same tax designation, it's, it's really silly. Uh, and I think we can uh, do work to, to separate them. And, and one thing I wanted to ask about is this quarterly reporting as an example. As a person who ran a, not a small nonprofit, was, we were a good size. Um, there was a circumstance that caused us to register for lobbyists, even though we legally didn't really have to. In the end, to do the report and to do the, uh, to file and to do the quarterly reports, I had to hire a lawyer. Yeah. Now, my organization was big enough to do that. Lots and lots of organizations are not. Um, so even though you've pared down the number of things they have to report, a quarterly report for a nonprofit I mean, look, people make grants to nonprofits at a million dollars a year, 500,000, yeah. 250. They don't require quarterly reports. Mm. They require annual reports. So the idea that if you have a meeting with a council member and you speak at the lectern there, that sentences you to quarterly reports uh, is, I, I just don't know that I'd ever get there. So the question is, do they have to be quarterly? Can they be annual? Can folks be exempted from reports, for example, if, like happened today, if someone comes and says, I'm Cynthia Stramman and I'm from SAGE, well, it's already on the public record that this person from this organization came <coughs> and spoke. Another person said their name and I'm from Minnesota Struggle and I'm from Clean Money, I'm from California. If they do that, yeah, like, do they actually need to go back and do a report to tell you, tell the city again that they did that, like it, it just seems um, like we're placing an administrative burden on groups that have little ability to handle it uh, in order to exercise not only their First Amendment right and their right as, as a California, but to help us make policy. Because the other challenge about all of this is it kind of assumes that if someone comes before the government or has a meeting with the government is for some 
untoward reason, or it could be for, towards some untoward reason. So I, just a question, is there another way to, to deal with this reporting to make it less administratively onerous to the nonprofit sector in particular? Council member, I, uh, we can always lessen the reporting. I think, and to your point in terms of people making public comment and the public being aware, I think the question here for the public is what information is the public aware of that is happening that is not on the public record? Got it. That's the concern. Got it. And, and um, other jurisdictions have monthly reportings. In fact, our proposal, uh, the previous proposals were uh, bi-monthly reporting, but we did listen to, the commission did um, you know, listen to the concerns of nonprofits and others and went back to the quarterly reporting that applied um, to everyone and to try to, to lessen it. And, and our goal here really is, you know, we do hear that and we understand that. And even given the limited resources that we have at the commission, we are always available to walk through anyone uh, through reporting and registration requirements. And I encourage any organization to do that because if we're walking you through it and we're helping you do that, there will never be an issue of, of misreporting or a violation. If we make a mistake, we'll own up to it. But I absolutely, you know, even with the limited resources, we make ourselves available every day to help anybody walk through the registration and reporting requirements. And, and, and you believe that this um, broad influx of reporters, which you would have, because a lot of people that aren't reporting now would have to, you'd still be able to do that? I, as part of our budget request, we're asking for additional position in this, absolutely. <laughs> But, 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 but it speaks to also a point of education. One of the concerns that we've had is the lack of resources to provide outreach and education to certain groups. So it's not simply about creating new laws to then request positions. Um, I've been with the commission for going on 33 years now, and these massive mandated laws are not just you know good ideas, they're legal requirements. And when we're not fully staffed to provide the resources to educate individuals, then it does create a gap there and an opportunity for people to make mistakes unknowingly. And so resources is critically important. And for us, um, providing education is, uh, is extremely important. And like I said, we take that very seriously. And as part of whatever moves forward, we will have a substantial period of time where we're going to make a big effort to work with the nonprofits and the unions to ensure they're fully aware of their requirements are, provide training, walk them through the registration process, and make staff available to help them file their quarterly reports. Right, and all of that is, is wonderful, should we provide the staff to do it, and that the nonprofits have somebody who has the time to stop the work that they're doing, and in addition to petitioning the government, that they have to stop what they're doing to tell the government that they petitioned the government. Um, so I, I just, I, I would, my ask is that, that you all, um, that you all think a little bit outside the box, and I know I've, I think I've been a, I'm on a little bit of a tech rant today, but you know, even if a nonprofit could just go on their cell phone and go to some portal and say, I gave testimony today, or I met with Councilwoman Hernandez today for 30 minutes, and press send, and be done with it. Like, because I've seen those forms. Yes. I, I, you know, it could be simpler. It, it could be, and absolutely we will we continue to, to work on that process. And just for some, for some clarity in terms of what was being asked of nonprofits right now, currently a uh, traditional lobbyist, the firm has to register and each individual mm -hmm. lobbyist has mm -hmm. to register. What is before you would require only the organization, the nonprofit, to register. No employees would have to register. The nonprofit would simply have to provide us the names of those that are lobbying the city um, and not, so it, it is substantially cutting back on who has to report on that, but we will absolutely continue to work on ways to make the process easier. Right, I'll, I'll close with this. The, the, the institutions are radically different <coughs> in size and scope and in capacity, and so I, I would just ask that we think about our interface with them in a radically different way. Like, it's not okay to say, here, we're gonna make this 10-page form a one-page form. It, it needs to be rethought entirely uh, with the people, with the audience that we have in mind um, in a way that facilitates and encourages them to get involved, um, but also gives the public the information that we deserve to have. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, we go to Council Member Hernandez, then Council Member Park, and then back to Council Member Bloom. Thank you, Council President. Thank you so much for being here uh, with us today. 
Uh, I feel like we've made a lot of progress on figuring out, you know, some of the best avenues for nonprofits, and you know, we're still so much to discuss and dig into. Um, but going back to, you know, Council Member Marquis Harris Dawson's comments, you know, we can we can agree that small and maybe even medium-sized nonprofits should be provided, you know, right-sized support in terms of lobbying. But that said, there are larger nonprofits that we've already been talking about, AIDS Healthcare Foundation or USC, that should be held to a different standard. They got tons of lawyers and millions of dollars to be able to figure that out. Uh, the Ethics Commission uh, originally set an upper limit of $2 million annually to help set those standards. Um, I want to say that, you know, I agree with setting limits like this to ensure there's a difference between small nonprofits and larger nonprofits, but is there a way that we can look at it differently instead of looking at the annual budget? Um, I, I launched, I uh, co-founded a nonprofit, I've worked with many nonprofits, a $2 million budget is not a lot of people. And uh, for a two, uh, an organization that's doing service delivery but still advocating for the city to do better so that it can do better service delivery, $2 million is, is most of the staff that does the delivery of services. So is there any way to look at how to maybe look at expenditures instead of the annual budget? Like uh, ask for you know what they're spending their money on. Like is it service provision? Is it you know lobbying time? I just I think the two million dollars is such a low barrier for a lot of nonprofits that it would just put so many in that bucket of being a larger nonprofit when it's not. So I just wanted us to think about that. If there's any way that we can in include instead of the limit uh, expenditure uh, documents instead or information. Um, and while we're still wrapping our head around the nonprofit and union exemptions, in order for us to be able to be better informed, can you uh, describe for us the current exemption of unions in existing MLO in the current uh, existing MLO? The, the <coughs> current exemptions uh, relate to their uh, ability to communicate with the Employee Relations Board, um, the CAO and others in negotiating MOUs. It doesn't exempt them when they're communicating with the mayor or the council or their staff on MOU related issues or any other issues. Got it, thank you. And can you tell us how this will change uh, with the proposed amendments? The current, um, the current amendments, um, what would change would, would be, the exemption would still be in place uh, it would be it right. They would be nonprofit filers. That's the only thing that would change. Um, the exemption would still be in place, meaning they could communicate with the CAO, Employee Relations Board, Civil Service Commission. Um, any communication with mayor, council, and staff would be triggered under the nonprofit filer uh, designation, and they would have to register and disclose that activity under that disclosure requirement. Thank you. So to be clear, unions would be considered nonprofit filers? Yes. Okay. Thank you for that clarity. Uh, to follow up, have you found any other jurisdictions with similar exemptions um, as are being uh, proposed right now for unions? Uh, no. <coughs> I'm sorry, so to answer your question, the short answer is no. We looked around at a lot of different jurisdictions. To the extent that there were any exemptions at all, they almost universally focused on conversations about the MOU. So the sort of core function of the union interfacing with the city officials to negotiate their own contracts, a lot of those interactions were exempted from the kind of activity that might qualify as lobbying. But in terms of broad, oh, there it is. <laughs> Right can, you, Excuse can you repeat me. your answer? Yes, please. I didn't yeah, hear, I, I could. heard very little of what you said. Yes, I'm sorry about that. So we looked around at a couple of, and to repeat the question just briefly, did we find in other jurisdictions that there might be broader exemptions for unions and other uh, employee organizations? The short answer is no. So we looked at a lot of different organ or a lot of different jurisdictions, excuse me, and generally what we found was that to the extent that there were any exemptions at all, they focused on the sort of conversations that David just described, which were conversations about the MOU, so the contract, sort of the core function of the union, the conversations about their employees' contract with the city, 
that sort of activity in general when we found an exemption was the kind of thing that was exempt. But in terms of a broad-based exemption, capturing all unions, that was not something that was common. So we would be setting a precedent as the city of Los Angeles with that? Well, in terms of what's before you, they would still be nonprofit filers. So there would be, in a sense, the reduced reporting obligations that the 501c3s and 501c5s would be subject to. But in terms of our research, yes, I believe that would be fairly unique. Thank you so much for that. Um, now, the same question regarding the nonprofits. Can you describe the current exemption of nonprofits in the existing MLO and how this will change with the proposed amendments? Currently, under the MLO, as I mentioned previously, there is an exemption where nonprofits that are providing services to in, uh, primarily providing services to indigent individuals are exempted. Um, so, under the current proposal, the the uh, subject matter exemptions would no longer be in place. They would be treated uh, simply based on whether they're lobbying the city um, and on a five thousand dollar threshold if they pay. Uh, an employee, staff member, $5,000 or more to lobby, then that would trigger the uh, nonprofit filer uh, registration and quarterly reporting. Great, thank you. And thank you for repeating it because I know sure. you, you've mentioned it earlier. Thank you. Um, just one more. Well, I have a couple more things, but um, can you talk about what the engagement with unions has looked like with the Ethics Commission? In terms of the the lobbying ordinance, this is something that we looked at changing the 30 hour threshold to a $5,000 threshold beginning in 2007. We have, we have had three substantive reviews during that time that have included uh, commission meeting hearings, interested persons meetings, uh, the ability to anyone to provide input through our website. We have reached out to all the organizations through our typical resources, so emails, um, uh, and other ways that we typically interact with uh, not only individuals that are part of our uh, lobbying program, but also individuals that are participating in our campaign finance program and uh, the other programs where we might touch these different entities. Uh, that's what we've done. We've heard substantive input from the nonprofits throughout that process. We have had <coughs> zero to very limited comments from the unions on any of these issues. That's interesting. You know, they haven't even tapped in, but we're about to, you know, give them this, uh, this, uh, well, we're not, we're not, we're, we're having a conversation about giving them um, more leeway. Thank you for that. Um, can you describe the difference and limitations between nonprofits and unions as it pertains to electoral campaigns? Are there any specific pieces of information you have or items such as independent expenditures? Well, in, in terms of the activity, Obviously, unions uh, are much more heavily involved on the uh, independent expenditure side. Um, I'm not familiar with what limitations non certain nonprofits, depending on the, uh, the, their designation, what their limitations are in being able to participate politically, whether it be through political contributions or creating committees. But most of the activity that we see on the election yeah. front is related to uh, unions making independent expenditures. Yeah. Uh, typically, what we see with nonprofits is more volunteering uh, uh, for campaigns. Um, while we do see that with unions, um, the, the reporting that we see mainly comes through the union activity. Thank you for that. And as a nonprofit that has worked on campaigns that I help work on, if you're a C3, you can engage. If you have a debate that you want to schedule, you have to invite all the candidates because there's so many regulations and uh, limitations and barriers as a nonprofit to be able to engage if you're a C3 in the political arena. If you're a C4, you can still engage, but even then there's limitations unless you're a PAC, a political action committee. Then you have a lot of leverage and freedom um, and less actual barriers um, to engaging in political work. So thank you for, for outlining um, kind of what the unions do, because they are heavily involved in the political process, both during the election cycle, but also as we saw, you know, last year, even in our local government. Um, you know, it's alarming to me to have C3s and C5s have similar exemptions in the current MLO draft, given the conversations we are having about redistricting and how the, you know, former leader of the LA Fed was, uh, you know, speaking in those vile conversations behind closed doors. And the information we have now about the differences in how nonprofits and unions operate in the political sphere and in political elections, uh, I believe we need to make a much clearer distinction 
between C3s and C5s. I don't think that lumping them up in this particular piece around lobbying and the ethics committee falls in line with the rest of the policies that we have, particularly in the political engagement process. So I have a lot of concerns about that, but really appreciate y'all for breaking it down for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And just to be clear, we are not proposing to give some broad exemption to unions or nonprofits that they that is different than what they have now. The proposal before us is to add reporting requirements, to increase their requirement to disclose their advocacy to uh, to the city, uh, which you know we we only need to have the exemption because we are changing the definition of what a lobbyist is in the first place. That's the reason for this. So, um, and, and I'd like to just ask if, if you can distinguish what in the proposal that's before us, what is different between the disclosure of a nonprofit filer and the disclosures of a lobbying firm when it comes to actual contact with city officials? So in other words, when, when you look at the proposed uh, requirements of the registration step statement for nonprofit filers. It includes each city matter the nonprofit filer has attempted or will attempt to influence any address related to the matter, any city reference numbers related to the matter, and so on. That's the same as for, for lobbyists, isn't it? Correct. Okay. So um, each agency the nonprofit filer has attempted or will attempt to influence, that's the same as for lobbyists, right? The name and title of each nonprofit representative who is a partner, owner, shareholder, member, officer, or employee, same as is required of lobbyists, right? And so on and so forth. <coughs> so the disclosure requirements of nonprofit filers and unions is going to be more robust than it is currently because they are now going to be swept into this municipal lobbying ordinance because of the change in the way we defined municipal lobbyists. That's, that's correct. There are a list of things that they wouldn't have to disclose, like the salary of the employee of the nonprofit that lobbyists do have to disclose. Um, but that, again, the discussion that, that was had at, at the committee meeting, my recollection, was in terms of focusing on the key things when an individual is touching council staff departments <coughs> and communicating uh, a particular issue, and that was the focus of, of the All of that will be disclosed. But to Mr. Harris Dawson's point, the whole issue of salaries and so forth. If you are a nonprofit organization operating on a $5 million budget or something, you can't hire the lawyer that you know, a professional lobbying firm has to be able to ensure compliance, which is why there's this effort to have a simpler process of providing the information that the public needs. That's the goal here. Um, so now there are certain areas of prohibition of activities that apply to lobbyists that, in my view, should not apply at all to nonprofits or to unions, such as participation in our commissions. Uh, I, and the one exception that, that I think Ms. Rahman's amendment captures, which is correct, is the Ethics Commission itself. But when it comes to mission-driven commissions, the people that I want to see appointed to those commissions are people who have a lifetime of advocacy in that area that they can share with the city in developing policy. If you have a commission that deals with uh, rent control adjustment, you want to have somebody who has spent time working for a public interest law firm or a tenants rights organization sitting on that commission. And if we didn't have this differential treatment, they would be prohibited in the same way that a you know, lobbyist at a major law firm or a major lobbying organization uh, would be prohibited from participating in their city government. So that's the reason for this distinction. Council Member Park. So thank you. And I think, you know, one of the things that we have spoken about in prior committee meetings and one of the pieces of feedback that I have repeatedly heard, particularly from neighborhood council members who have taken the time to offer their comments, is that we want to know who we're speaking to. Whether we as elected officials take a meeting with someone or whether it is someone coming to make a presentation 
to one of our local councils. And I just see a few differences in the current draft of the ordinance that caused me some concern about whether we're actually getting at that policy goal. So for example, if you look at section 48.07, which is registration requirements for lobbyists, the actual lobbyist name and contact information as well as their employer's information is required. For lobbying firms, it's the same contact information, uh, including for individuals with authority to act on behalf of the lobbying firm, as well as all of the partners, owners, shareholders, members, officers, or employees. Uh, similar language applies in section G to major filers, but when we get to H, which is nonprofit filers, they're required to give the name and title of the nonprofit filer's executive director or chief administrative officer, and then the name and title of non each nonprofit representative who is a partner, owner, shareholder, member, officer, or employee. But not, there's no requirement to disclose who's actually doing the lobbying, who's actually advocating to influence or change city policies or to advocate for a particular outcome. And then when we get to the quarterly disclosures, if you, which is in section, Forty-eight point oh eight for the nonprofits, and this relates to a minor technical nit as to Councilwoman Raman's amendment item one that says specify that nonprofit representatives listed on the disclosure, disclosure forms shall not be eligible to serve on the ethics commissions. Well, the actual the registration forms is the only place where any detail about the individual people is being included in the quarterly. Reporting forms, the only thing that a nonprofit has to include is the person who filed the report, not the people who did the lobbying during that quarter. quarter. And so I'm just, I'm not sure that we have actually structured this in a way that gets at the underlying question of how do we know who we're talking to? Am I missing something in my assessment here? Because for the nonprofits, unless it is the executive director or the chief administrative officer, how, how would I know? Yes, I think your assessment of the language that's in front of you is correct. Um, I also think that the Ethics Commission would say that the names of the nonprofit representatives should be included in the, in the quarterly report. Because I would like to know if I decide I'm going to go back and pull quarterly reports, I want to know who the actual people are that are coming to neighborhood councils, that come to city council, that call my office and request meeting, meetings. Because if I don't have any database to look at that, I don't have any, necessarily any way of knowing who they are. Yeah. Correct. So I think that's just an area that maybe could use a little bit more fleshing out. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. I just want to make sure I wasn't, it was not there and I just wasn't seeing it. Okay. And just on the issue specific to the proposed amendment in the first paragraph with regard to uh, ineligibility for <coughs> service on the Ethics Commission, um, to address Councilmember Park's uh, uh, concern, uh, it, it should probably indicate, specify that uh, anyone who qualifies as a nonprofit representative rather than nonprofit representatives listed on the disclosure forms. If that makes sense, Councilmember Robinson. Okay. Councilmember Blumenfield. Thank you. Um, first, most nonprofits are reporting, certainly they're reporting their top salaries in, in their 990 forms and, and on their annual tax returns. So there is some cross referencing we can do that's not quarterly, that's annual, that we can do to get that information. Uh, I want to drill down on, this, on the threshold question, the 5K. Um, one, I want to understand how we actually enforce that. And then two, what actually qualifies. So if you have a, non a small nonprofit, the CEO is being paid $100,000, let's say, and they come in and they spend 1% of their time lobbying the council. That's, uh, 
that would count as a thousand dollar threshold. Is that is that would that is that how you would determine that, or is it yes. they actually have to be paid above and beyond their at, their annual salary? No, it's whatever hours they spent, whatever the hourly rate is times the hours that they spent lobbying. So if they're a salaried employee, they get a regular salary. They have to then go back and calculate how much time they spent. Correct. Working on lobby, interacting with the city. Yes. Um, and if it's more than five percent. It triggers the threshold. What if it's, what if there are four people in the organization, each one spends two percent of their time, so none of them get more than five thousand dollars, but the organization spends more than five thousand dollars. Does it, that trigger? It does not, council member. It is per individual. Per individual. So that's an important point when we're thinking about our small nonprofits. I, I can't imagine there's going to be a lot of them that are certainly paying people. Um, more than five thousand dollars to come lobby the city, right? If if you even if you have a big campaign and you get a hundred people on the bus and you pay them all a hundred bucks, you, you know you're not getting there. Now, what about um, and then in terms of the payment, if you uh, if it's a reimbursable expense, like let's say an organization <coughs> pays people to come to city hall, but they're just they're paying for their their bus fare or their lunch, are those counted at, toward that $5,000 or are those, are those reimbursed? Expenses? I think based on the discussion that we had in council committee, no, those are not the types of things we would consider compensation. So if you don't work for the organization, it's literally what you're being paid above and beyond your expenses. Correct. So, okay. And if you do work for the organization, uh, you have to calculate what percentage of your salary is going to that, and that percentage has to be more than 5,000. And it, and even if you have 50 people in the organization, as long as none of them crosses that $5,000 threshold, the whole organization doesn't have to um, register. So how, on a practical basis, you know, do we have any sense of how many small nonprofits would be, would even be impacted by this? No, I mean, other than the, the conversations that we've heard anecdotally from them and the compensation, um, we don't think it's going to trigger many of them if, if they're limiting it to 5, 000, under $5,000 compensation. Yeah, that's, I mean, I'd love to understand that, I, the practical implications mm -hmm. better because I can imagine scenarios, but I, you know, yeah, I've got a good imagination, but I, I'd rather it be, be rooted in the real world in terms of who we're really going to impact because it does seem that that is a, a threshold that you really have to go out of your way to, to cross, that, that a small nonprofit is not going to accidentally cross, I don't think. But I'd be interested in having testimony from folks in the real world uh, about whether this, you know, looking, looking backwards, whether they would have been impacted by this. Well, uh, and council member, obviously, depending on what eventually gets passed, if the $5,000 threshold is what gets passed. We absolutely, within a year or two, will be doing a study looking back on how many entities are being captured by this um, and whether we need to make any changes to that. Right, and, and how, do they, how does it even get enforced? I mean, it's really hard to go figure out, especially if you're dealing with a percentage of someone's salary, a percentage of the work that they do. Um, well, the, the current process for us would involve um, obtaining uh, records, employment records, hours worked, looking at council files, looking at public documents, look, it, getting subpoenas for emails, it involves an investigative process for us. That's how we determine whether somebody's complying or not. Yeah, I mean, that seems like a really difficult, I mean, you have to, you have to really build a case. Uh, I don't know, that seems really difficult to enforce. And then, um, so the, that's the, the threshold, and then it do, if you do find or suspect someone is, has crossed that threshold and you bring it to their attention, is there, is there a, a, an ability to cure? There is, but it really de it's an, a case-by-case -case basis. Um, if we're talking about you know, an individual that is you know, just a very minimal hours currently up on, you know, above the threshold, then we would work with them in order to register and report. If it's another individual that has previously registered and is familiar with the laws, there, there is no curing. We would hold that person accountable for failing to register. I think if we're looking at nonprofits and 
um, those types of organizations coming um, into the program as new individuals. We have to work with them, train them, and probably establish some type of period where you know we are going to be um, treating it as an education component and not enforce on those types of issues. The goal is going to be getting them familiar, making the process easy for them, um, and then at some point down the line, obviously having to impose penalties depending on what type of violation exists. Right, and then, and then what happens if they cross that threshold, you know, they haven't reported, haven't reported, then, then they realize they cross that threshold, you know, in month nine, do they have to go back nine months and report all of those yes, nice. interactions yes. for those previous nine Currently, months? Currently, yes, we make them go back <laughs> and register and report the activity that applies. It, it, it's disc for disclosure purposes, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's, so in some ways, the burden starts even before you cross that threshold because you need to be tracking. Mm -hmm. Correct, and, and, and I mean, again, we'll, we'll take a look at this depending on what eventually gets through, but those kinds of thresholds are important currently in the program because if you're a traditional lobbyist who isn't doing that, then you potentially could have made contributions that were not allowed made gifts that were not allowed, and we would have to capture those as violations right. also. No, I, I see that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I like Ms. Paris Dawson's idea about having, you know, having an app for that kind of thing so that nonprofits who are coming in, they can, you know, when they do come in, they can just kind of plug it in and then eventually see if they ever even get close to that threshold. Because um, like my colleagues here, I, you know, I, I want full disclosure, concerned about our, our small nonprofits and, and, you know, although Again, I'm, I think that threshold seems like a, a pretty good inoculation, but, but I don't know the reality of that. Um, but anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you. Oh. Councilmember Hernandez. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Council President, earlier for the clarification. And I apologize. I heard earlier that these amendments will actually reduce reporting for unions. Can you please clarify that for me? Well, as a nonprofit filer, they would be in a category that would have um, less items to disclose on a quarterly report than a traditional lobbyist. Got it. So the amendments take us from, do the amendments take them, move them from a place where they have more things to file to a, a place where they have less things to file? They, they do. Uh, they, Sorry. It's not the key things like the department that, uh, that they're lobbying, the agency they're lobbying, the matter. It is different types of activity depending on what is allowed. Um, you know, we talked about certain campaign fundraising activity may not be disclosed, um, gifts, things like that. So um, it, it depends on, on where we land, but it, there would be less things. And the discussion um, in terms of the disclosure that would apply to them is sort of was trying to speak to Council Member Harris Dawson's point of trying to limit the burden that we're placing on nonprofit filers uh, and the work that they would have to do every quarter on reporting all this activity. So that's, that's where the focus of that was. Can I ask a follow-up question here? Um, Thank you. Which is just, just to follow on that, I think there's like three, two different points that we need to compare from, which I think will be useful for understanding where we are right now. Um, one is under our current structure, we have this 30 hours a quarter, is that right? Or 30 hours a year? In a consecutive three month period. So th so 30 hours a quarter that you of lobbying behavior that you have to meet in order to be asked to report what you're asked to report as a lobbyist, right? That's, that's the bar. Which groups do I for any group, okay. for any group, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then the updates to the ordinance took that down to a $5,000 per year floor, right? So suddenly a whole set of actors are captured by that new lower floor that weren't captured by the earlier bar. Right, and so that's why we're having this complicated discussion, right? So I think it's just really important for us to like make sure we're, we know why we're here. Suddenly now, a whole set of nonprofits that would not have met that 30 hours per quarter floor do meet the $5,000 a year floor. 
and certain kinds of labor unions may also meet that, I, I don't know, that, that weren't covered by that 30 hour a quarter floor. And so I think what happened then was that there was some discussion about how do we make sure that we are still getting transparency out of all of these actors that are coming into this space while not, as you said, unduly burdening some of the smaller nonprofits um, and also leaving out really powerful actors that should frankly be treated like regular lobbyists, right? So that's why this is hard to do is because we're grappling with something fairly complex. So I just want to make sure that we're all, you know, we're all acknowledging that this is not a straightforward issue. Mm. Uh, we're really trying to figure out, I think, a solution that gets us to the greatest level of transparency and disclosure that we can get to that, and that we want for LA while still making sure that organizations that are not capable of doing the kind of reporting that a lobbying firm can do are still asked to provide some of those disclosures and still be able to continue to engage with City Hall on the important issues that they do engage with and we want them to engage with. So I just think that's important for us all to be understanding as we're talking about this. Thank you. And if I could also just add, I think power dynamics is important too because unions are much more powerful, much more stronger, much more well-funded than some of these nonprofits. And as we're having these discussions, I think equity is important to a reference, but also the power dynamics that we exist in. Thank you. All right, any other comments or questions, members? Okay. Just, um, yeah. just a, a question that, that uh, I look forward to exploring further uh, with people who have expertise in this, including you all. The, the, what is the advantage from a written quarterly, of a written quarterly report versus a live updating database that's open to the public? So for instance, when people come here to City Hall to speak, they fill out a form on that kiosk it gets data, I presume that data is stored somewhere. One of the things it asks you is the organization that you're with. I would feel, I feel like it's easier both for the user, for the person who's doing the reporter to do that, and it's easier for me, because I can actually look up, you know, as Ms. Park, uh, Councilwoman Park said, not only can I look it up easily, I can look it up for what you did last week. Not, what, not a quarter from now, you know, and however long, however much time you have to submit the report, and then however long it takes to put that report uh, so that it's available to the public. I, I just am struggling with this idea that it, we have to stay in this uh, system of, of reports. So what are the advantages to these, these quarterly written reports? Well, Council Mayor, I want to clarify, they're, they're not written reports. All our, all our quarterly reports are is uh, is their electronic reports? Individuals okay. log in and data enter it. Right. And there, the, the nothing requires anyone to wait till the end of a quarter to fill out that information. If somebody wants to, they can log in, register right now, and type in the date and time and the matter that they lobbied and the, on and today. They're done. And it's there. They're done. They're done. If they have okay. no activity once, and they can actually file at that time. They could file it because they know they're not going to have any activity the rest of the quarter. If they want to leave it open, they can leave it open, not filed, and it will sit there until they have any other activity. Then come the uh, filing deadline, they would just enter it. So that's the way the system is set up, typically. But you're, you're absolutely right. Typically, most people wait, like we all do, right. <laughs> until the deadline to do it. But currently, you know, with the, with the, the amount of information that nonprofits will have to f file, if they know what their issue is going to be and they know what staff members are going to be working on it for that quarter, they could absolutely go in, type in the individual's name, the matter, and file, file it for that quarter and they'd be done. Okay. Yeah, th thank you for that. I, I mean, I, I, again, I would just strongly suggest that if, you know, as someone who did this as a, as a person at a nonprofit, you know, if you wanted to get parking, you had to call and say your name and the day you were coming and the license, what kind of car you had and the license number, that's data that the city already has. Then you fill out that form in the back there. That's, we, you're giving the city the data a second time. 
and then you do your quarterly report, you're giving them to them a third time. It just seems like in this day and age, we can do better. That's understandable. And what we do is what we collect, the information we collect on the registration, that populates your quarterly report. Got so it. many of that information won't be required to be entered again. It would okay. just be the, any new information. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mr. Blumenfield. Just a quick follow up, um, because it's, it's related to, I mentioned at the beginning, it's the same thing. I wish we could do, Mr. Uh, Mr. Harris Dawson, what you're suggesting in terms of just have everybody fill out that form right off. But the, as I understand it, we have a legal problem with the Brown Act uh, and the First Amendment. We can't just require that of people. We have to go through this whole song and dance with lobbying or, or nonprofit filing and crossing a threshold because, uh, because we can't even require people to put their, their names out there. So that's, that's one of the reasons why this is a bit of a convoluted process uh, because it would be much easier to just require people to put, fill out who they're, if they're being paid, how much they're being paid and, and put it out there. But, but we're, we're in this knot from the Brown Act and from the First Amendment that prevent it. And so at the moment, this is the only pathway we found to get that disclosure that we need. I wish there were an easier one. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not allowed to respond to, to people in the audience. We cannot legally require people on these kiosks to put their real name or if they're being paid because of the Brown Act and because of the First Amendment. I wish we could. Um, but that's, that's the reason for going into these gymnastics, which are very confusing, but we need to have some way to get the information that we all want to get. All right. Um, so there have been um, okay. Well, um, I hope you've taken all this in. Uh, there's a <laughs> there's a lot of issues. I I think um, we've done a pretty effective job in trying to anticipate some of these, but. There are subtle issues that have, have been raised that Mr. Harris Dawson raised about the burden on, uh, on some of the nonprofits uh, that Ms. Park raised about you know, some of the disclosure, the specifics of the disclosures. Mr. Blumenfield's point just now about how we enforce in compliance with the Brown Act. Um, these are some additional issues that I think we would value your uh, thoughtful consideration of uh, and weighing in. So I think at this point, um, I'm, gonna hold, I'm gonna suggest that we hold this on the desk in committee, uh, that we try to do some additional work before the committee reconvenes on some of these issues and specifically whether there is a way to distinguish between small and large nonprofits, whether there is a way to differentiate between unions and other kinds of nonprofits. Um, I don't know that there is constitutionally, uh, but I think it's worth at least reflecting on that because it is consistent with what I said at the outset, which is we should distinguish between lemons and limes and, um, and not deal with these things with a broad brush. So I think these have, this has been a good discussion. Um, with that, we'll go ahead, and if there's no objection, we'll hold this over uh, until our next meeting. Ms. Rahman. I just want to say that um, I hope that there'll be an opportunity for us to hear some of the responses to some of the questions that were asked today in our next meeting. And if there is a way for you to share some of that information in advance of the next meeting so that we can process and digest it, I think that would be really helpful as well. Um, and ensure that you're reaching out to some of the stakeholder groups that were brought up today, um, the small and large nonprofits, particularly the small, um, and then some of the, the labor groups as well in, in doing that. I, th I think that would be very helpful for all of us. So then in order to, in order to do that, let's, you, you took careful notes, I take it. Okay, <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna ask that we request the Ethics Commission to report back with responses on each of the issues that was raised uh, by the members today. That'll, that way it'll be on the council file, um, consistent with the Brown Act, and we'll be able to vote on it when we come back again. 
Uh, if there's no objection, thank you. that'll be the action of the committee. All right, uh, with that, uh, thank you all very much. Appreciate your uh, patience in enduring a long but thorough and important discussion. Uh, with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>